video is brought to you by Brilliant. Go to brilliant.org slash Sarah Zed and sign up for free. Also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. On December 3rd, 2014, three brothers and their dad sat down to play a game of Dungeons and Dragons. It was supposed to be goofy and pointless, not super good, but just a fun, simple way to pass time. Instead, that very game propelled their already popular brand into further fame, making them some of the most successful podcasters of all time. On November 2nd, 2019, three brothers and their dad sat down to play another game of Dungeons and Dragons. It was supposed to propel their already popular brand into further fame, making them even more successful podcasters. Instead, that very game started to spell the downfall of an entire brand, thrusting a previously pretty chill fan base into a bitter and contentious rage. The McElroy family led a small series of fun brotherly podcasts into an online media empire. For years, the Brothers McElroy were treated not just as content creators who people liked, but as an institution of their own. Their brand chock full of merch, hyper niche online references, and even McElroy specific lingo, the entire family, as well as the podcasts that they made, were nigh untouchable. Fast forward a few years. The fandom still exists, and the brothers are still very popular online creators. But the fan base surrounding them is just different now. It's a lot more contentious, a lot less overwhelmingly positive, and to some extent, a lot more steeped in cynicism. And from the outside, it's a really weird thing to behold. How did this massive media empire, famous for its fan culture of unbridled positivity and fervent dedication to these brothers, turn into this? The answer is complicated, but at least in part, it stems from a single game of Dungeons and Dragons. How does one campaign of a fictional game with dice and math and shit help cause the downfall of one of the biggest family media empires around? Let's find out. The McElroy brothers are a family of podcasters and content creators from Huntington, West Virginia. Their father, Clint McElroy, is a former radio personality with a decades-long career in local radio. He's also written some comics and has a journalistic background. <laughs> Suffice it to say, the guy is good at making creative content, especially creative audio content. So Clint's three sons, Justin, Travis, and Griffin, were definitely raised in an atmosphere that incorporated those things. Uh, Justin McElroy is the oldest of the brothers, and then you've got Travis in the middle, and finally, there's Griffin. Justin and Griffin both have backgrounds in journalism, as well as an appreciation for the gaming world. They both have histories reporting in local news, and had both written pieces for the gaming website Joystick in the 2000s. Travis, meanwhile, has a theater background, having done professional tech work in the theater world at the same time. And back in 2010, these guys started their first ever podcast called My Brother, My Brother and Me, which is a mouthful, so it's just Mabim Bam for short. The gist of Mabim Bam is that the brothers find weird or crazy questions on websites like Yahoo Answers and riff on them together, coming up with silly answers or just making jokes in general. The show would later expand to having recurring bits and segments outside the Yahoo Answers format, like joking about funny fast food press releases, weird eBay listings, or just generally scouring the internet for weird content and making jokes about it, but early Mabim Bam leaned really heavily into the Yahoo Answers thing. And honestly, the podcast's beginnings are not great. They're definitely not the worst thing in the world or anything like that. The brothers were all, for the most part, fairly funny, and they clearly found a good premise to work off of. But it's... I mean, to start, the audio quality is noticeably awful, even if you're not a big audio person. Uh, we, we take your questions every day, every... Well, not every day, every week, and we... Every will, second, real time. Every this second. Is, this is why it's a modern show. It's every... Just call. Every, Just now. call. Now. Like, it's very clear that none of them have good mics or great audio editing in general, and it sounds pretty rough. <laughs> Believe me, I would know. The humor is also just kind of half-baked at best, and unnecessarily mean-spirited at worst. It's definitely not the most offensive thing out there, but there's quite a bit of casually throwing slurs around, making jokes about people's weight or harmless hobbies or sexuality, and just general casual meanness. It isn't super out of the ordinary for what you'd expect from a bunch of straight white guys in their mid-twenties shooting the shit in 2010, but it's definitely pretty rough, and it's a far cry from the brand of unrelenting inclusivity and wholesomeness they later become famous for. And in case you're worried this is me just being super mean to these guys right off the bat, rest assured that they 
themselves hold the same opinion and have apologized for the content of early episodes, even repeatedly encouraging fans not to listen to them. Regardless, My Brother, My Brother and Me gained a steady listener base throughout 2010, finding itself one of the top 10 ranked comedy podcasts before the end of its first year. Part of Mabim Bam's success can likely be attributed to the fact that, at the time of its inception, podcasts weren't really a mainstream thing yet. They weren't brand new or anything, as they started to really become a digital thing about five years prior, but they hadn't blown up the way they have since. Pretty much every estimation I can find puts the number of active podcasts at the time at around 150,000 or so. Nowadays, of course, that number is somewhere between 850,000 and 2 million podcasts, and the percentage of people in the States who know about them has jumped up to 75%. So Mabim Bam definitely wasn't coming into the podcast world at a time where like no one knew about them or anything like that, but it wasn't the incredibly saturated market that it is today. Through some combination of the lower barrier of entry into the podcast world and just the fact that people genuinely enjoyed Mabim Bam and the Brothers content, the podcast quickly enjoyed success. In early 2011, following the release of their 37th episode, the Brothers joined a podcasting network called Maximum Fun, with episode 38 being the first one as part of the network. Max Fun, which has existed since 2004, was founded by radio host Jesse Horn of Bullseye fame and featured other podcasts like rebroadcasted 1950s prank show Coil and Sharp, comedy storytelling show Risk, and later on, especially famous shows like Adam Ruins Everything and the Beef and Dairy Network podcast. The shift from independent show to Maximum Fun subsidiary was a big deal for Mabim Bam, partly just as a symbolic indicator of its success, and partly because it meant that the brothers were now going to start doing ads. They introduced a new segment, The Money Zone, to their show, advertising for pretty much every popular podcast product here. I'm not going to name them because they're not paying me, but if you've listened to any podcast that has ads ever, you know the ones. They also got a new theme song, which was written and performed by Bean Dad from Twitter. Yeah, I remember that guy. With the podcast now gaining ad revenue, Mabim Bam continued to grow in popularity over the next year or so, even beginning to do live shows toward the end of 2011. These shows initially brought in a pretty moderate crowd who would basically serve the role of the Yahoo Answers people. Friends could come up and ask their own questions to the brothers, and they'd answer them and rip off of them in the same way they would normally. With the adoption of ads and live shows, Mabim Bim Bam only grew in popularity, gradually moving away from the slightly edgy humor of ye olden days and toward a much more distinctive brand. If you've never listened to My Brother, My Brother and Me, it might be a bit confusing to describe the appeal, especially if you look at them. I mean, the premise is cute, but nothing overly complex, and the brothers look and sound like pretty generic dudes. But some of the appeal is in the really specific brand that they've cultivated for themselves using a number of methods. The first is just the way these guys talk. They've got a pretty distinct and recognizable speech pattern that manifests in a few McElroy-isms. <laughs> Stuff like calling pretty much everything boys, like this tea is a very tasty boy, <laughs> or saying modern instead of modern, Griffin saying ah beans a lot, using good good as an adjective. Both the vocabulary they use and their general inflection and tone of voice is really distinctive, and it's something a lot of fans, whether intentionally or unintentionally, pick up on. It's worth noting that they didn't necessarily coin or invent a lot of these phrases. Uh, a lot of them are either West Virginia slang or just popular catchphrases in general. Um, Pobody's Nerfect is considered a McElroyism by some fans, and that one's years and years and years old. Or some people think no tea, no shade, no pink lemonade is a McElroyism because one of them likes to say it when it was actually coined by drag queen Jasmine Masters. But nevertheless, even when they didn't coin specific terms themselves, their collective way of speaking registered to a lot of fans as particularly, well, them. If the if this boy's a rattling, you best get skedaddling. <laughs> My name is Root Beer Sir. I'm a team just like you. <laughs> Did somebody order snacks? Fruit roll up. Small young. Dumb and full of. You know it, I see you got a little <laughs> winky <laughs> face. Obviously, this musical is a whole can of worms, but there are actually two overt, deliberate references to the way the McElroys speak in 11 Tony Award-winning musical Hamilton. The creator is friends with the brothers and put in two lines deliberately modeled after their inflection and speaking styles. Unless. 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 Have nothing. I don't have to tell you anything at all. Unless. Unless. Should we honor our treaty, King Louis' head? Uh, do whatever you want, I'm super dead. 
The podcast also started to pick up a lot more regular running bits, like the ones mentioned earlier. The more recognizable segments of the show, like reading weird Amazon reviews or press releases, served both as opportunities to get in some good good goofs and opportunities to build a recognizable and consistent brand. I will say, my personal favorite of these segments, where one of the brothers reads off two real Hallmark Christmas movie summaries and one fake one and the others have to guess which is which, is woefully underrepresented and needs to appear more than the once or twice it has. It's also noteworthy that their brand started to shift somewhere around 100-ish episodes into Mabim Bam. It started to take on less of a generic, sorta offensive bro podcast vibe, and instead started to lean really hard on inclusivity. The brothers started talking more about allyship to various social groups, there were a lot of explicit statements of support for LGBT plus people and creating safe atmospheres for women, and the podcast just generally became fairly well known for being a safe space for marginalized groups. The brothers also did stuff like putting their pronouns in their Twitter bios, and released several apologies for older, more pernicious content of theirs, encouraging fans to avoid old episodes and stating a commitment to do better in the future. Personal growth and empathy, please don't listen to the old episodes, that just ain't us anymore. Only so much of that blame that I'm willing to take. We grew up in West Virginia. You're pretty lucky that we don't just talk about how the white man is oppressed and how girls should cover up their thighs. We got 18 years of Southern Baptist raising. We're doing our best. Sometimes it's tough to get from out from under that shit. That's not necessarily to say they were perfect at this, and that's something I'll touch on later, but at the very least, the podcast began to be perceived that way by a pretty large number of people, and Mabim Bam began to build an audience that consisted pretty heavily of women, queer folks, and other marginalized groups in general. I will say that the main exception to this, at least from what I've seen at live shows and the like, is that the audience still skewed very heavily toward white people. Nevertheless, inclusive was quickly perceived as a foundational pillar of the McElroy brand. The brothers also introduced a rule at live shows by the name of No Bummers, and what that rule meant basically is that if you were going to come up and ask the McElroys questions at live shows, it couldn't be about a topic that could get really heavy or depressing. So stuff about like relationship drama, or serious mental health issues, or just any topics that could typically be considered upsetting. This was done for a couple of reasons. The first is just that Mabim Bam is first and foremost a comedy podcast, and it's kind of hard to make jokes or build any real comedy off of inherently depressing topics, at least at a live show without any preparation preparation or warning. And secondly, there's just the general fact that there was starting to be a problem of people coming up to the brothers and dumping really personal and serious problems in front of an audience, which just creates an uncomfortable atmosphere for everyone there. No Bummers was only a rule in the very specific context of those live shows, and in my opinion, was definitely a good one in order to maintain the energy and comfort of people there and to let them do their jobs as comedians. What's interesting, though, is that No Bummers quickly became the ethos of many Babim Bam fans not just in the context of live episodes, but in general. You can easily find loads of unlicensed Mabim Bam merch with slogans like No Bummers, and it's considered both an official and unofficial rule in a number of McElroy fan spaces. Even where No Bummers isn't explicitly codified as a rule in spaces on Facebook and Reddit, it's an ethos that's especially common among fans and common in discussions surrounding the show. On top of McElroyisms, inclusivity, positivity, and running bits as a particularly distinctive brand, Another thing that ingratiated a lot of people to the show is the family vibe that it has. If you've ever seen that tweet about what it's like to listen to podcasts, Mabim Bam is a really great example of it, because unlike a lot of comedy podcasts where the presenters are funny and get along but don't really feel that close, you really do get a vibe of family closeness when you listen. Whether it's the kind of jokes and teasing you really only get from siblings, family goofs and nicknames coming up on the podcast, or just a general feeling, Mabim Bam definitely conveys that the brothers are family and enjoy each other's company. You look like a businessman with an extremely specific fetish. <laughs> you look like a new character in Candyland that just steals Twizzlers. You look like a, a vaudeville usher who's trying for a management position. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, you look like a Halloween costume to represent farts under a blanket. <laughs> And on one hand, that's really great. It makes for enjoyable content, it's always nice to see people get along, sibling relationships are cool. But on the other hand, for some fans, it makes the dynamic sort of 
enviable. So, okay, this term is probably going to come up a lot in this video, and most of you probably already know it by now, but for the few of you who don't, I feel like I should specifically contextualize it. So the term parasocial relationship basically means a really one-sided relationship, not because of unrequited feelings or anything, but because person one invests a lot of time and energy and feels a lot of closeness to person two, but person two doesn't even know that person one exists. The term was coined in the 50s with the advent of famous television personalities and musicians suddenly becoming a lot more accessible to people, but you see it a lot today with actors, sports teams and singers, and other celebrity professions. I touched on this a little bit in a video I made way back in the day, but while this has always kind of been a thing with celebrities, it's become way more of a thing nowadays with personalities like podcasters, YouTubers, and especially streamers becoming popular. That's largely because part of becoming a successful internet personality compared to being a proper celebrity is that you need to maintain some degree of authenticity and approachability. This is largely because your success as an internet personality is often based not just on people liking your content, in the same way you'd see for people liking a singer's music or liking an actor's movies, but rather liking you as a person. It's a lot easier to listen to a band and not care at all about what they're like as a person than it is to watch a streamer and not care. Their personality, seeming authentic and approachable and likable, is part of what they're selling. And so you see parasocial relationships being a really big thing with anyone whose job can be summed up as internet person, <laughs> folks coming to see online creators as friends and therefore having expectations of a friendly relationship with them to some degree. And of course, that same heightened degree of parasociality is also true on the flip side too. When those creators do something fans don't like, the degree of betrayal is a lot more personal and a lot more intense. The creator didn't just produce something fans didn't like, they betrayed their friends friends, so you get a lot of really intense backlash and the whole process is kind of a mess. Insofar as it relates specifically to the McElroys, a lot of McElroy fan content, especially at the height of both podcasts' popularity, is really just parasocial as hell. And the family relationship that the brothers have really plays into that. The podcast oftentimes has this aura of closeness that can make people really want to be a part of it, or even feel like they are a part of it. And as the podcast got bigger and bigger, this became more and more of a thing. In 2012, Justin and Griffin helped co-found the video game website Polygon, a site that, if you're even remotely into gaming you've almost certainly heard of. Nowadays, the site is known for having hosted a lot of big names like Brian David Gilbert, Patrick Gill, probably some other people with the word Gill in their last name, and some other people it's best to avoid talking about. Suffice it to say, Polygon is a pretty big name in the world of games journalism, and its founding, much like the inclusion of ads in Mabim Bam, is a great signifier of how far their success had taken them. Justin was one of the editors at large for several years, and the two brothers started making a number of series for the site. You had Monster Factory, a 2015 show where the premise was just them fucking around in video game character creators, making fucked up little guys and making jokes about it, with the videos often starting to take on lore of their own. You had Griffin's Amiibo Corner, my personal favorite, that takes on this very awkward, almost Tim and Eric-like vibe of a guy standing in his room reviewing Amiibos by how well they fit into his mouth. Ryu's fighting style has not changed very much over the years, but his clothing style sure has changed. Look at his red hair and tasteful pumps in Street Fighter 1, but in Street Fighter 5, he is more of a buff dad. You had the brothers posting Let's Plays of various video games like Pokemon and Far Cry Primal and Spore, and there was just a lot of good gaming-related video content coming out of these two brothers. These were just a few examples. In 2017, Griffin even received a Forbes 30 Under 30 Media Luminary accolade for both his podcasting and his work on Polygon. The year after Polygon's founding, Justin started doing a podcast called Sawbones with his wife Sydney, who's a medical doctor. The premise, basically, is that she provides a lot of interesting information about aspects of medical history, and he provides the jokes. Sawbones, like every other piece of McElroy podcast content we'll talk about here, is also on Maximum Fun, so they have the same ads and the same network. Later on, the other brothers started doing podcast content with their wives as well. Travis and his wife Teresa doing etiquette podcast Schmanners, and Griffin and his wife Rachel doing the Bachelor fan podcast Rose Buddies, though that one later got a rebrand. Sydney also hosted a podcast with her siblings titled Still Buffering, putting the number of in-house family-only podcasts pretty high. 
That being said, Sawbones is really the only one out of those podcasts that stood out as its own thing rather than just a McElroy product for existing fans. You'll hear a lot about people who listen to Sawbones and don't listen to Mabim Bam like they're just Sawbones fans, but there aren't really a large volume of people who listen to, say, Schmanners who aren't already McElroy fans. Basically, these, while popular, are largely podcasts for people who already know and like the brothers and want to consume anything they make. Travis also started appearing on a number of other non-McElroy podcasts like one about dogs, a whole bunch about internet culture news, one about apocalypse survival, and one about Doctor Who. And as previously stated, with the rise of not just a single McElroy podcast, but an entire family empire came a rise in parasocial fan relationships. Whether it's people calling the brothers by the nicknames they use for each other, talking about them in the same affectionate way you'd talk about a family member, or just the way people would tweet at them sometimes, there's definitely a pretty heavy culture of people viewing the brothers as friends or even family members. It's something the brothers have also definitely played into, whether accidentally or on purpose, calling fans terms like friends and strengthening the familial association between podcaster and listener. And nowhere was this parasocial closeness more apparent than in live shows. As the brothers got more and more popular, live shows started to become more and more hectic and chaotic. The questions people started asking stopped being open-ended ones that the brothers could easily riff off of, but rather what I could generously describe as people auditioning to be the fourth McElroy brother. Whether it was people going, this is more of a comment really, trying to replicate the brother's humor to their faces, trying to perform quirky weirdness to an audience, or or even in some cases trying to promote their own podcasts directly to the McElroys, the atmosphere at live shows definitely took on a very parasocial element. These are my good good friends and I need to impress them and prove that I am like them. <laughs> this all culminated in an October 2017 live show that is now infamous for being horrible and to this day it has never been released to the public and probably never will be. Long story short, it was a bunch of people trying really hard to be funny and not asking any actual questions and a lot of uncomfortable bits that went on for way too long, and it forced them to change the system of people asking questions to make it so that you could no longer just walk right up and say whatever. But as someone who has been to a Bim Bam live show as recently as 2019 in Nashville, I can confirm that the vibe of people, well, auditioning to be the fourth McElroy brother never fully went away. Now I'm gonna drop a fucking hot take express right here, but in my opinion, parasocial relationships aren't always inherently awful. That is to say, people feeling emotionally invested in celebrities or sports teams or streamers and devoting a lot of time to caring about them isn't necessarily a harmful or toxic thing. I think the main reason these relationships can become so toxic and dangerous isn't the mere presence of emotional investment in a famous person, but rather a question of unbalanced expectations. Because when you treat a celebrity like a friend and you therefore expect them to treat you like a friend in return, even though they realistically realistically just do not have the capacity to care about you in the same way that you care about them, you're setting yourself up for failure in a way that's likely to harm both you and them. And when you expect a creator to be perfect and never let you down because they're your friend and they love you, one of two things starts to happen. Either you can become really, really dedicated to defending them online in the same way you would defend an actual close friend and essentially come to view them as both in need of your protection and incapable of doing wrong, or they prove themselves imperfect and you direct all of that anger and hostility back toward them to a disproportionate degree. These are two very different but very distinct modes of parasociality and we're going to see both of them on display quite a lot throughout the rest of this video. And realistically speaking, we're probably going to see a lot of it in the response to this video too because I'm saying things that are both positive toward the McElroy's products and negative towards them. So let this section serve as both contextualization of how people tend to interact with McElroy products going forward, and also as a warning to anyone watching this who is going to feel as though I am either attacking their personal friends if I say anything negative about their work, or attacking them personally for liking a given work. In either case, it's not true. The McElroy brothers are not your friends, and if you enjoy anything that's going to get talked about negatively, or take personal comfort in it, or it's just really meaningful to you, that's great, and I'm glad that's the case. So with the wings a lot of fans started to see the brothers in mind, it's time for the McElroys to almost accidentally create what would arguably be their biggest phenomenon to date, the Adventure Zone. So back in 
2012, when the podcast was nearing 100 episodes and was becoming really big, there was this Yahoo Answers question about how you should break up with your D&D party. And the brothers get to briefly talking about Dungeons and Dragons, and well, you can hear for yourself. Hey guys, how do I break up with my D&D party? God damn, I miss Dungeons and Dragons. Me yeah, too. man. It's good. To, it's a good time. Can we start like a D and D podcast so I have an excuse to do this every Why week? Don't we Is this something this? we can do over the internet? I'm... Let's just turn this dumb show into a weekly D and D session. <laughs> It's so interesting to listen to it now where they clearly intended it as a joke. The idea of doing a podcast where you just play D&D &D and doing it remotely over video call was obviously this kind of silly, ridiculous idea. This was back in 2012, so stuff like Critical Role or Harmon Quest didn't exist yet. That's not to say the concept of a D&D podcast was non-existent. Podcasts like All Games Considered had been running since 2005, but never to huge mainstream commercial success. It was this kind of silly, outlandish idea. One of the brothers later suggested they call it The Adventure Zone, a play on the name of their sponsor segment, The Money Zone. The brothers did talk about enjoying D&D and how they missed playing it, but this very much was a joke idea at the time, and the joke hung there in the air for two years without much reference to it or specific callbacks to the idea of the McElroy brothers play Dungeons and Dragons in a podcast setting. But then, two years later, something very interesting happened. Gaming company Wizards of the Coast, who had been working on this for the past two years, released D&D 5th Edition, or just 5e, the current and possibly most well-known edition of Dungeons and Dragons. 5e, which came out midway through 2014, quickly became known for being a more accessible and straightforward version of D&D than its predecessors, especially with the release of new modules. These are pre-written adventures that a dungeon master could either modify to their liking or just run for the players completely as written. And with the release of 5e quickly came the release of The Adventure Zone. Yeah, two years after that joke, they turned The Adventure Zone into a real podcast. Before I talk more about The Adventure Zone, or just Taz, I also want to briefly note that I am also in a D&D podcast, and as will become relevant later, a D&D podcast that focuses on a magical school setting. I've been doing it since the beginning of 2019 now, and it's very fun. I'm not going to promote it in this video because that just feels kind of cynical and icky, but I'm saying it now both as a way of disclosing any potential bias and also just communicating that I have personal experience with podcast production and D&D podcast production in particular. So when I'm talking about D&D podcasts or what makes good podcasting for an audience, I do to some degree know what I'm talking about. So one really interesting thing about the release of D&D 5th edition is that Griffin, who's the dungeon master for Taz, was able to review the starter set for the system before it was released to the public. That means that not only was Griffin on the ground floor of its release, but for a while, he was one of the only people out there with the ability to gain a good grasp on the system's rules when preparing for it. This pretty much means that Taz was in a really good place in terms of the D&D podcast market. It already wasn't super saturated in general because D&D podcasts weren't yet a hyper popular genre genre, and especially because they had the ability to learn the system before almost anyone else. Already starting from a fortunate place, the Adventure Zone took off pretty quickly. Taz is a bi-weekly podcast originally based on the Lost Minds of Fandelver, a pre-written module for 5e that is specifically designed for first-time players. It's a pretty straightforward adventure. You get hired by this guy named Gundren Rockseeker, who, along with his buddy Sildar Hallwinter, seems to have gotten kidnapped. Your aim is basically to do some dungeon crawling, fight some goblins, and learn about a villain named the Black Spider, an evil mage trying to find a magical forge and get power. It's fine as a beginner adventure. It's designed for low-level players, and it's a lot of people's introduction to the kinds of classic tropes you'll run into in a lot of D&D games. But it's also not the most exciting adventure out there in terms of both its relatively straightforward nature and the fact that, as written, some of the characters like the Black Spider are a bit bland. At this point, though, only some of the McElroys have real D&D experience, so the first couple episodes of The Adventure Zone are pretty straightforward Lost Minds. The party consists of Justin playing fan favorite Taco, an elf wizard whose quest is to invent the taco, Travis playing Magnus Burnsides, a human fighter who rushes into conflict and looks out for his friends, and their dad, professional radio personality Clint McElroy, playing Merle Highchurch, a dwarven cleric who worships a god named Marthammer Duin. Griffin, meanwhile, is our DM. These characters, as expected, aren't the most developed in the beginning. Taco's personality is mostly just funny idiot, Magnus's personality is fighter, and Merle's personality is cleric. 
The first few episodes of the Adventure Zone pretty much just consist of the players figuring out how D&D mechanics work, telling lots of jokes and doing goofs with each other, and seemingly having a pretty good time. It was definitely consistent with the McElroy brand of humor. For example, they all decided Sildar Hallwinter was a boring name and renamed the character to Barry Blue Jeans instead. Just stuff like that. Many characters were even named after listeners, keeping fan engagement high. But pretty soon after, Griffin started putting his own spin on the story, taking the established module of Lost Minds and building something bigger off of it. These characters started to see hints of a bigger mystery. Skeletons with magical items attached, characters saying things that they couldn't quite comprehend, all that. Pretty soon, the framing device of Lost Minds was nigh unrecognizable, as the story built off of characters like the Black Spider, whom they renamed Magic Brian, to tell funny jokes and advance a deeper narrative about some kind of secret organization whose members were, for some reason, in the same dungeon as the main party. The story quickly expanded to be about the party joining this secret organization with a moon base, where their goal is to recover these seven super powerful magical items that have caused wars and destroy them as soon as possible before these nameless villains named Red Robes get their hands on them. There's definitely a pretty clear blend of comedic and serious going forward, the podcast taking on a more focused tone, but still having funny elements like a store called Fantasy Costco staffed by a warlock named Garfield. Nevertheless though, as Taz progresses past its first arc, you very much get the sense that the podcast is starting to take itself a little more seriously. The podcast arc gets an actual name, the Adventure Zone Balance, named after the secret organization they joined, the Bureau of Balance, and the characters start to go through a bunch of different mini arcs as they recover different items, often very clearly themed after a specific genre. You've got a time loop arc, a sci-fi arc, a Mad Max arc, a murder mystery arc. In all of these cases, there are very clear thematic influences from specific works of fiction that Griffin likes. The podcast also starts incorporating music composed by Griffin himself that honestly sounds really nice and wouldn't be out of place in a video game or something. And the characters start gaining a lot more depth too. We get a sense that Taco isn't just an idiot wizard, but a pretty clever person who acts that way on purpose. Merle retcons his god to a nature god Pan and gets more divorced hippie dad vibes, and we learn more about Magnus's backstory as he develops a friendship with another society member. Taco even gets a boyfriend who is an emissary of a death goddess, and he's just great. His quest to invent the Taco, by the way, gets quietly abandoned as the players and DM get more and more invested in the story. There's a call out to it in the finale, but it doesn't really get brought up for most of the time. <laughs> Finally, we get a lot more hints that things aren't necessarily what they seem with this organization, with things like the characters realizing there are these long, long gaps in their memories, statues of red robes with their own faces behind the robes, or mysterious references to a character named Loop. As Taz's balance progressed through dozens of episodes, it would only get more and more successful, eventually even overtaking Mabim Bam as the most popular McElroy family podcast. The lower barrier of entry to Taz compared to something with as many episodes as Mabim Bam, the narrative appeal of the story, and the rising popularity of D&D brought forth by things like Critical Role and the release of 5e all led to Taz gaining an increasingly large fan base. Live shows skyrocketed in their number and scope. The first ever Taz live show happened a year after the podcast started, focusing on the small, semi-canonical side adventures of the main characters. Soon enough, the brothers started doubling up on live shows when on tour. You could go to Mabim Bam Live on a Friday night and then be at Taz Live on a Saturday night. And much like with Mabim Bam, Taz also started to be known for its inclusive brand. Whether it was Taco being gay, the large number of cool female characters on the show, or the two canonical lesbian couples, people were generally pretty happy with the representation on the show. At one point, two of the lesbian characters' arc ended with them being transformed into a tree, a move some critics saw as playing into the bury your gaze trope, and that was undone by Griffin in a later arc. For the most part though, people were pretty happy with the female and LGBT plus representation on the podcast and with balance on the whole. There were some people here and there who wished that it had always maintained its more irreverent, goofy tone from the early arcs, as well as people who hated that stuff and wished it would stay more serious, but for the most part, Taz could only get more and more popular. From loads of fan art and animatics and cosplays and fan music to the way listener ad messages for the show would sell out almost instantly, it was quickly becoming a juggernaut and by far the McElroy's most successful podcast. This culminated in the late 2016 announcement that the Adventure Zone Balance would be turned into its own series of graphic novels, to be released annually over the course of the next several years. As the podcast started to release its late game, a lot of very big and kind of controversial moves happened. One was a spring 2017 
2017 sneak peek of the upcoming comic book, where some fans were frustrated by a seeming lack of diversity. All three of the main leads were depicted as white, which frustrated a number of fans who were hoping for more diverse representation in the show. At the center of a lot of these critiques was the character of Taco, with some fans explaining that because of his name and the fact that he had a quest to invent tacos, depicting him as anything other than Mexican, or whatever the fantasy equivalent might be, would be offensive. You know, like having a white guy be the one to invent tacos is, you know. <laughs> Conversely, some fans thought this would be a terrible idea because having a Mexican character named Taco who steals and lies a lot and is played by a white guy seems like an explicitly offensive stereotype. Feeling that there was no way to win in that situation, the McElroys opted to change Taco, who was depicted as white in the original comic release, to be blue-skinned instead, changing the character of Merle to have dark skin and making slight adjustments to Magnus' character design as well. The reception to Blue Taco was mixed, with some people critiquing it and some people expressing that they felt it was the safest option. This controversy was definitely not an earth-shattering one for anything the family made, some people online got upset, and it provoked a lot of interesting discussion about whether making characters aracial is something that can work, or whether it's something that should be avoided and when that is and isn't the case. But for the most part, after the comic's redesign, the brothers were pretty much fine. They put out a statement explaining why they thought it was the best call, and some people agreed with it and some people disagreed with it, but on the whole, it didn't really do much to alter the McElroy's state as apparent podcasting titans. This is especially so because earlier that year, My Brother, My Brother and Me got a TV show adaptation, produced by streaming series CISO. The premise was that the brothers would go around solving people's problems, often with surreal or comedic asides, and celebrities celebrity guests. It's a pretty fun and enjoyable show with a lot of cute moments, like the brothers shopping for haunted furniture, or mentoring random high school students, or throwing a tarantula parade. Sadly, CISO shut down before the show could ever get a second season, but nonetheless, the Mbim Bam show was both enjoyable content on its own, and a sign that at this point, the brothers' fame was pretty much untouchable. Another, more minor controversy that happened throughout late 2016 and early 2017 revolved around a late Taz arc called The Suffering Game which dealt with the characters being trapped in a game show designed to inflict misery on them, with a lot of bad stuff happening to them along the way. Because Taz only released episodes once every two weeks, a lot of people found the experience of the characters going through the same motions over and over again while experiencing a lot of misery and suffering to be unpleasant to listen to and weren't super happy with the arc. I personally caught up a couple months before Balance ended and experienced the Suffering Game via binge listening, so this wasn't my experience with the arc, but a number of people found it unpleasant or just frustrating in general, especially because it aired over the course of several months because of the bi-weekly release schedule. After the Suffering Game came a short arc where the characters realized their organization wasn't what it seems and confronted the founders, and there came a whole bunch of other revelations and fan reactions as we learned the twist of the podcast. That, spoiler alert, the main characters and their colleagues are from another planet, and in fact another plane entirely, having been on a hundred plus year space expedition and having their memories erased at the end of it, and they themselves were the red robes who created the evil artifacts. We then got a flashback arc using a modified version of Powered by the Apocalypse, another TTRPG system, basically going through the entire hundred years that they forgot as the characters got their memories back. Each episode consisted of one or two vignettes of the characters and their families and friends exploring a new planet as it got gradually swallowed up by the big bad of the show, a faceless, world-destroying entity known as The Hunger. Particularly notable about this arc was the fact that Taco, who had previously been known for being a bit of a guarded loner who didn't trust easily, had a twin sister with him throughout the arc, named Loop. Much like with the rest of their backstory, Taco's memories of Loop had later been erased throughout most of the podcast. Loop was pretty popular with the fandom for a number of reasons. She was a cool fire wizard, she had a bold and outgoing personality that meshed well with Taco's, and for people who were looking for positive representation in the podcast, people liked the fact that Loop was a trans woman. Um, but I wanted to say, as long as we're talking about your backstory, that the two of you are twins and that Loop was assigned male at birth, but at like a fairly young age, uh, she transitioned and identified as a 
um, a, a female elf and as, uh, you know, as Loop. For a lot of folks, it was nice that the McElroys didn't shy away from describing her as trans, but that she also had interests and goals and romance and traits of her own without solely being defined by her transness either. Part of the stolen century involved her falling in love with Barry Blue Jeans. <laughs> yes, the Barry Blue Jeans from earlier, who was originally a joke character based on Lost Minds, as the two worked to become immortal together. A lot of folks really liked Loop, and she soon got a swath of fan art, cosplayers, and generally a huge fandom. The stolen century in general, though, was pretty controversial with fans. Some folks loved seeing the characters' backstories as they became close and grew as people over a thousand years and found the ending, where people's memories were all erased one by one, really sad and compelling. Conversely, some folks really hated it. They hated the shift away from using D&D as a system, found the pacing to be off, they thought the whole thing deprived the players of agency over their own backstories, since no matter what, the story would always end the same way, and they found it to be pretty limiting to the players in general. And indeed, this arc consisted of a lot of Griffin just monologuing, something that, if you're mainly listening for the other players, could get pretty frustrating. Not to mention, the moment where the characters found out their memories had been erased was a pretty big cliffhanger, and the stolen century with its much chiller vibes went on for several months, leading fans who just wanted to see what would happen to the characters in the present pretty frustrated. And in all fairness, it did go on longer than both what Griffin had planned and longer than what a lot of fans wanted to hear, leading to some frustration within the fan base. Some people also just didn't like the shift from a fantasy setting to a really sci-fi story that takes place on a spaceship, especially given that the podcast was almost over. Nevertheless, the stolen sentry served as a way to establish these characters' new backstories, answer a lot of the mysteries that people had wondered about for a long time, and establish the narrative weight of what would be our new big bad, the hunger. After the stolen century, we got the final arc of the characters getting back their memories, bringing back Loop, reconciling with everything that happened to them, and most importantly, saving the world. The 69th and final episode of the Adventure Zone Balance released on August 17th, 2017, almost exactly three years after its first episode. And it was big! Searches for the Adventure Zone spiked on Google to an unprecedented degree. Swaths of animatics and beautiful pieces of fan art were released less than hours after it came out. The cast and audience alike cried at the ending. The finale of the Adventure Zone Balance broke the D&D and McElroy-related internet for weeks. It was big, and it was epic, and it was dramatic, and it was also the last time the Adventure Zone would ever reach those levels of hype again. That's not necessarily to say that the Balance finale was the best episode they've ever done in a technical sense, it wasn't. There are parts of both Balance and the next arc that we'll talk about in a second that are probably better executed. But in terms of the fandom and the hype the podcast got, this is effectively where the Adventure Zone peaked. And although Taz would never get those levels of discussion and excitement again, that didn't mean they were done. Clint and the brothers took some time off to figure out what to do next, and they announced that they'd do a few five-ish episode mini-arcs in different systems, each one run by a different player. Except for Justin, who's done a little bit of Max Fun Donor exclusive stuff, but doesn't seem super into the idea of GMing for the podcast in general, which, fair enough. With these systems, though, came a bit of a challenge. Balance was never supposed to be as good as it turned out to be. It was a cute game of family members goofing around and having a good time and not taking themselves super seriously. The characters were never even supposed to be big heroes, they were just kind of shitty people who fucked around and went on adventures. But the story progressed into this big, epic, dramatic thing that's being lauded as being one of the best D&D podcasts ever, and it's like, where do you go from here? The metaphor that gets used the most often, I think the brothers themselves might have even used it, is that balance is a car that learned to fly. But the pressure is on, and a lot of people are expecting a dramatic and heartbreaking story again, and so you can't just build another car. You have to build an airplane, and you have to do it while it's already mid-air. It's just a lot of pressure, is what I'm saying. The first mini-arc was called Taz Commitment, a superhero story GM'd by Clint and using the system Fate. Commitment is… okay. There are definitely some problems with it, like way too many NPCs being introduced too early and some of the player characters being a little bit one note, but it generally was pretty well liked by fans, with one exception that I'll talk about a bit more in depth later, but in short, Justin created a character supposedly with input from Inuit consultants who is supposed to be like an Inuk woman who transforms into an ultra-powerful Inuk goddess sometimes, like a Bruce Banner Hulk situation. It was a thing, I'll explain more later. 
Anyway, commitment was, for the most part, kind of weak and kind of unmemorable, but there were still some charming moments and character interactions, and you can definitely tell Clint and the brothers had a lot of fun with it. Then we got a mini arc called Taz Amnesty, an arc GM'd by Griffin using a system called Monster of the Week. It's very much inspired by stuff like Twin Peaks or Gravity Falls, centering around a small town where mysterious cryptids live and have to keep their identities secret. <sighs> It's uh, okay. There's clearly potential there, with the setting being a West Virginia town that the players clearly recognize and are invested in, but there are definitely a lot of flaws that stop it from being that compelling of a mini arc, and a lot of that seems to stem from this pressure of making it a serious and impactful and compelling story from the get go. A lot of the story beats are clearly predetermined, and a lot of roles happen where the result of the role is just completely ignored if it doesn't fit with what's supposed to happen in the story. The characters are mostly split up and doing their own dramatic individual scenes, so we don't really get to see them hang out or do goofs or even really be friends. Which is bad when you build yourself so strongly off the vibe of a family D&D game. In a lot of ways, the Amnesty mini arc was part of the shift from the Adventure Zone becoming less of an RPG podcast and more like a partly improvised radio play. They'd always played hard and fast with the rules before, but Amnesty felt like it was taking itself extremely seriously from the get-go, and that was, in my opinion at least, to its detriment. Nevertheless, there were some cool character concepts that hit on a lot of well-liked tropes, like the chosen one who didn't want to be chosen, the stage magician who accidentally learned she can do magic for real, and the scuzzy owner of a fake cryptid tourist trap who just found out real cryptids exist. It was rough, but there was potential is what I'm saying. Then we got Taz Dust, the final of the mini arcs, GM'd by Travis using a system called Urban Shadows. It's basically an old fashioned wild west town in a world where vampires and werewolves are in some sort of gang war and the characters are investigators thrust into solving a murder mystery. Dust is… decent? Like Commitment and Amnesty, it has its weak points. They kind of got handed the answer to the mystery in the end, and the players didn't really have that much choice in what happened beyond go to one of the very few set locations I have planned out and talk to this NPC. Nevertheless, it was a pretty tight arc, with some funny interactions between the characters and NPCs, some concepts like a mysterious crime lord that could warrant some interesting expansion, and a pretty enjoyable setting. It definitely wasn't perfect, but it was the first time a lot of general public members got to see Travis at the GM seat, and it voted decently well. So when the family announced that the next long-form arc for the Adventure Zone would be a continuation of Amnesty, the reaction was mixed, to say the least. Some people were happy about it. Some people really loved Amnesty and were excited to see more of it, especially people who really liked Griffin's stuff in general or just thought the vibes of the setting were cool. On the other hand, a lot of people who didn't really like Amnesty as a mini arc were a little bit hesitant, wondering why we didn't get more of Dust or just a different story altogether. Nevertheless, the podcast quickly picked up where they left off in the middle tier middle child of the arcs. And it was good, mostly. There are still some pretty rough flaws in the middle, whether it's the characters being separated way too much for one-on-one -on -one scenes and thus never really having enough interactions to feel like good friends, fight scenes constantly being interrupted by backstory flashbacks that destroy any tension or perceived danger you could get out of a combat interaction, or just a lot of really dry world-building moments relating to the fantasy realm the cryptids come from that fail to really engage the players. But there's still some really good stuff there. Kepler, the town it takes place in, manages to be a charming place with an easily accessible vibe, themes of class inequality and being trapped between multiple worlds start to get explored in an enjoyable way, the characters are pretty likable for the most part, and there are some fairly compelling monsters and factions and NPCs. We also get the introduction of a force called the Quell, a faceless, mononymous, color-coded entity that consumes and corrupts, and it's strikingly similar to the hunger, but whatever. Lots of good and enjoyable and well put together stuff in the middle of Amnesty. There was a bit of divisiveness surrounding Travis's player character, Aubrey Little, for a variety of reasons. Um, so Aubrey is depicted as a bisexual Latina woman who uses a lot of fire magic and loves her pet rabbit, and pretty much every aspect of that sentence caused some kind of ire with someone. Some people thought the bisexual representation wasn't well handled, either because Travis seemed to just 
just pick the first female NPC he met and have Aubrey immediately pursue her, even when she doesn't really get a lot of screen time or development, leading a lot of people to think it was performative. Though I think this is an understandable critique, I will say that I, as a bi woman, was personally fine with her as a bisexual character, for whatever that's worth. People also felt like there wasn't much of an attempt to depict Aubrey as Latina beyond just saying that she was, especially given that Amnesty takes place in some version of the real world. Some critics felt like if you're gonna play a person of color in a real life setting, you should think about their culture and background, and that didn't really happen with Aubrey. A lot of people also just found her grating for whatever reason. It seems like Aubrey was pushed as a really quirky and awkward character, and some critics found her more of a caricature and less of a person. I was just kidding. It's, whoa. Hey, this is Dr. Harris Blancas. Conversely, a lot of people really loved Aubrey, especially artists on Tumblr who found her fun to draw and fun to listen to. A lot of folks found her awkwardness and quirkiness less grating and more relatable and enjoyed her on the whole. The fact that Aubrey draws a lot of attention to the fact that she's bisexual wasn't necessarily a negative for a lot of fans who might themselves make jokes about their sexuality a lot, especially when there's often such a stigma against bisexual characters in media actually referring to themselves as bi. Like, if I have to hear another I don't like labels line again. Suffice it to say, Aubrey was divisive and just as many people loved her as hated her. If you want my Aubrey hot take, she's fine. I don't have a strong opinion on Aubrey, to be honest. It's worth mentioning that, much like the people who didn't like Aubrey, there was and continues to be a pretty large contingent of people who don't like Travis for a variety of reasons. Travis is definitely the most theater kid -y of the brothers, doing a lot of loud bits and being the most visually out there of the group. There are times on the show where he interrupts the other brothers a lot or does bits that are intentionally unfunny, with the joke being that the other brothers are annoyed by it or does interesting voices. And some people really like this brand of humor and other people find it grating. It's worse, it's worse, it's Wait worse. Me peace. It's worse. It's, it's like he's in my ear. I hate my, it. My piece needs riddles. No, that's nothing. That's riddle hey. me piece, piece me riddles. There was also a minor scandal where it was revealed that Travis had been fudging his dice rolls during balance, constantly giving himself high numbers like 18s in combat and other encounters. He argued this was to keep the pace of the game in story, but for a lot of people, especially those really into D&D, it felt like he was cheating and taking away from what makes the game actually compelling. He's also the most online of the brothers. Unlike Justin, who doesn't tweet that much, or Griffin, who doesn't tweet at all, he's regularly engaging with fans across various platforms, which means there's a lot of content there to love if you love him, and a lot of content there to hate if you hate him. As a result, much like Aubrey, you have a lot of people who really relate to and love Travis, and a lot of people who hate him and find him really irritating. This is definitely a tough and complicated thing, because sometimes this can manifest itself in genuinely toxic ways. For example, Travis likes to paint his nails and take on more feminine presentation sometimes, and it's not that hard to find people making fun of him for it, you know, claiming he's only doing it for attention, which none of your business, <laughs> or trying to frame everything he does as manipulative or untrustworthy in some way. He's in the past publicly discussed experiencing mental illness, talking multiple times about struggling with, in his words, depression, PTSD, ADHD, and narcissism, something that can make it especially hard to be a public figure. Like, the guys experienced a lot of genuine harassment for harmless behaviors. On the other hand, a lot of people over the years have begun to criticize Travis for what they perceive as basically performativity. Travis, probably more so than the other brothers, has really made being woke and progressive and safe part of his brand. Some people really appreciate that and feel supported by it, but a lot of people have also found some of his attempts to seem inclusive more self-serving than anything else. It's happened quite a few times, whether it's posting a selfie with a caption about how attractive he is supposedly to support sex workers writing trans rights on a scrap of paper and taping it behind him on a live stream and then dead naming historical trans men in his etiquette podcast, interrupting people on a game stream to lecture them about how we should say partners instead of lovers because some partners don't make love and then saying lovers anyway a few minutes later, or this thing where after the 2016 US election he... Okay. He released this seven minute audio message to fans about how he was there for all of them and he loved them and was holding their hand and how they should tell their friends they love them and that 
people should do self-care and not think about it for a couple minutes and hashtagged it, hashtag I am holding your hand. Some people found it genuinely comforting and appreciated the message of support, but it also started to get quite a bit of criticism among people who didn't like Travis as primarily being self-serving and making it about himself, for the don't think about it stuff being tone deaf when it's a message to genuinely scared marginalized people, as well as just the general issue of how encouraging fans to see you as their friend and protector can be dangerous. It's a difficult situation because we are talking about someone who has clearly struggled with a lot of things in life and is probably genuinely well-intentioned and has experienced a lot of unwarranted shit for it, but who also does seem to have a history of behaving in kind of performative ways that seem to accomplish the goal of making him look good more than the goal of materially helping people. It's always hard in a situation like that where someone's experienced a lot of genuine criticism and also a lot of unwarranted harassment, and speaking as someone who has been there, it makes it genuinely difficult to parse that feedback and take anything actionable from it, because you're not always sure whether it's in good faith, and oftentimes you have hundreds of people demanding completely contradictory things from you and it's impossible to please everyone, and the sheer volume of it can be genuinely overwhelming. This is such a like dumb example, but even the tea thing, like. If you can't see the tea in my mug, everyone's like, oh my god, there's no tea, you're, you're faking the tea. And if you can, they're like, this is stressing me out, you're gonna spill it. <laughs> you can't please everyone, you can't. <laughs> to this extent, I do empathize with Travis, and while I think a lot of the stuff he's done does come off as performative and frustrating, I do understand the genuinely difficult position you're in being any kind of public internet person. Nevertheless, though, I think the way the Travis backlash parallels the Aubrey backlash is incredibly interesting. Obviously, some of the Aubrey backlash was just people not liking Travis, but the blend of well-thought-out stuff about whether the character was thoughtful representation or just self-serving performativity, mixed with a small number of people who just wanted to be shitty about an LGBT character, mixed with people who just found her annoying, is very fascinating. Aubrey discourse really was just a microcosm of Travis discourse. Despite some of the rough storytelling moments and the device of the Aubrey character, Amnesty really does improve from its rough beginning, and it's got a solid middle. As Amnesty reaches its end, it starts to get really good and really intense, and spoilers, we see something we've never experienced in Taz before, the actual permanent death of a player character. Okay, uh, while I was exporting clips for this video, um, I was reviewing them to make sure the framing was alright, and it seems like there's like this weird shoujo anime dream filter on the camera. Uh, and I don't know how that got turned on, and so if this does not automatically get turned off, I would like to apologize uh, and also clarify that this is definitely, like, a dream sequence now. <laughs> Clint's character, tourist trap-owning grifter Ned Chicane, who might be one of the, if not the best played character in the history of the show, ends up sacrificing himself to save another person's life. And it's compelling and beautiful and genuinely surprising and sad, and it's honestly really well done. It definitely feels more radio play than TTRPG podcast. You can tell Clint agreed to it in advance, and some things were scripted and edited in after the fact, but nevertheless, it's really excellent and enjoyable. You're like, damn, Amnesty is really really, really, really good. We then near the ending of Amnesty, and it's kind of bad? <laughs> like, the story takes this bizarre, drastic tonal shift in the last five-ish episodes into this tangentially related story that makes almost no sense compared to the stuff we've already seen. All of a sudden, it shifts into the realm of sci-fi, and we find out Aubrey is a cosmic chosen one who's the living manifestation of an alien planet, and we get this last-minute twist villain that's this AI that pits hostile worlds against each other to preemptively destroy them before they rage intergalactic war, and that's a genuinely cool idea, but it's so out of left field and inconsistent with the tone of amnesty up until that point that it feels bafflingly shoehorned in. They suddenly have to deal with aliens and spaceships and saving the entire universe, and suddenly the small town setting and Gravity Falls vibe and themes of duality and inequality they spent so much time crafting is utterly irrelevant to the story. It's weird and rushed, and it's especially bizarre when you realize that the exact same thing happened with Balance. Suddenly the story shifted to being about spaceships and aliens and saving the entire universe, and the finale got way bigger and more dramatic out of nowhere, and it worked with Balance for the most part because there was time to build it up. But with Amnesty, it just feels repetitive and out of left field. It's really bad, and it leaves me unsure of how to feel about Amnesty, an arc that has a pretty bad start, an incredible middle, and a really bad ending. 
I mean, I still enjoyed it altogether, but damn, it's very much a victim of that problem I talked about earlier, where the expectation that came from balance is that Taz's stories start out small scale and then have to lead into saving the world and being big and emotional. It's strange because small scale stories can honestly have much more real feeling stakes in my opinion. Like when the story was we have to protect our small town and keep the secret of these cryptids, the stakes felt real because there was a feasible fail state that affected characters we really care about. But as soon as the story abruptly shifts into saving the whole world in this intergalactic conflict, we all know there's absolutely no way they're going to fail at that goal, nor are there relatable grounding characters whose fates we're super concerned about, and so it just feels like a showy victory lap with minimal tension. By the end, it got to the extent where we got these long, emotional, unearned monologues from Griffin that felt like they were there to just signify that we were witnessing an impactful moment, there were entirely scripted scenes with guest voice actors, and the podcast just didn't seem sure whether it wanted to be a high production value, high stakes radio play or an actual play RPG game. And so the abrupt ending of Amnesty weakened its ability to do either. Nevertheless, fans responded to the finale of Amnesty with a resounding, eh, that was pretty nice. It didn't achieve nearly the same level of hype that Balance did, and this is reflected in the Google Trends search for it, the relatively smaller number of fan works you can see for it, or even just the vibe of discussions about it online. This could be for a number of reasons, whether it's that they weren't using the well-known D&D system, that people just didn't want anything new after Balance, or that the introduction to Amnesty was quite rough, but nonetheless, the Amnesty finale's reception was pretty big, but not balance big. And although the ending was fairly rough, it wasn't enough to sour most people on the concept of the Adventure Zone or anything like that. I mean, graphic novels were still releasing to massive success, with the books hitting the top of the New York Times bestseller list, live shows were selling out massive venues like the Ryman Auditorium, which I attended by the way, great time, and people eagerly anticipated the next season of the Adventure Zone, whatever it may be. I would like to go back in time and apologize to all of those people. So a few weeks after the Amnesty finale, a trailer was put online for the next season of Taz and it featured a lot of exciting announcements. For starters, things were taking a turn for the familiar as the group was returning to playing D&D again. However, things were also going to be not too familiar as this would be the first time a main Taz season would be DM'd by someone other than Griffin, Travis. Theoretically, this could be an exciting change of pace for the show and a way to appease the audience on the whole. People who missed the playstyle of balance would get to see D&D back, while those who wanted some variety would get to see the new experience of Travis as a DM and Griffin as a player character. Most people generally liked Dust and so saw Travis as a good DM, leading to a lot of hype for the new season. The premise was also promising. The animated trailer pitches the show as being about a magic school where students will learn the ins and outs of becoming either a professional hero or a professional villain. However, the player characters would be at the school for sidekicks and henchmen, learning to assist the heroes or villains that they were assigned to. It's essentially sky high, but in a fantasy setting. This season would be called The Adventure Zone Graduation. There was a lot of genuine interest and enthusiasm when this trailer came out. There had never been this much effort placed into Taz's promotional material before. Compare the graduation trailer with the balance one, which was made after the campaign was finished, and see the difference in quality and presentation. Boast state-of-the-art facilities and instructors with real-world experience. Students study combat. Or even with the Amnesty one that includes some cool animation work, but is still not nearly as high production value as this. The new season's trailer was the most upvoted post in the Adventure Zone subreddit. The comments are all excited and hopeful and talking about how cool of a concept it was and just a bunch of people really, really looking forward to it. Even some random YouTuber named Sarah Z got into it, leaving a comment expressing interest in the season. Which in turn made things weird when the first episode of Graduation came out a few weeks later and it was bad. Bad. I once again feel the need to restate here that if you like Graduation, or if you're one of the McElroys and you're watching this, this is not meant to be a personal attack. I am not saying you are wrong. I am not saying you are a bad person. I am not saying you have bad taste. If you derived meaning from this story, that is fine and you are fine. But at least speaking as someone who has experience doing a magical school D&D podcast and has played a lot of campaigns and listened to a lot of TTRPG podcast stuff, it's not good D&D and it's not good podcasting. 
So if you've never listened to Graduation and you know nothing about it, a very, very brief summary of it is that the characters all have various reasons to go to this hero villain school. We learn pretty quickly that heroes and villains in this world aren't heroes and villains in the traditional sense, but rather almost like professional wrestlers, performers hired to have fights and make money for the towns where the fights happen. And honestly, that's a genuinely interesting premise you can do a lot with, both in the sense of setting up a magical school around it, but also in the way that it blurs the lines of what those labels even mean and introduces themes of how people are placed in endangering situations for the sake of profit, and you could get at real critiques of how this is an actual thing in pro wrestling and it's fucked up and there are so many angles you could approach that with. But then the entire premise of a magical school and the hero and villain system kind of gets dropped a few episodes in. Instead, we find out that the school's headmaster got turned into a dog by an evil demon prince named Grey who wants to have a demon war. The characters keep trying to do things to avoid having the demon war, like they go, what if we just kill the demon prince? But the demon prince keeps popping up and going, no, you have to do the demon war, so they prepare to do a demon war. Then we find out that there's a god being that's like a yin and yang between chaos and order, and that's the real being that wants a demon war, and they're like, oh, well that sucks. <laughs> The characters do some work for a mercenary group that gives them various missions, but then turns out to maybe be kind of bad, sort of like the Bureau of Balance, but not. The characters keep trying to find creative solutions instead of doing a big battle where a bunch of people will die, but they keep being told no, and so then they do a big battle where a bunch of people will die, and they win, and they all go into business, and they're very successful and happy. There are some more specific plot points that I'll go more in detail about in a second, but that's pretty much the gist of it. Despite the fact that some of the introductory concepts are kind of interesting in the story, only really starts deviating from its original premise a few episodes in, there are a few signs from the beginning that the season isn't going to be great. The first episode of Graduation is two hours long and is primarily focused on introducing us to our main characters. And by main characters, I don't mean the player characters. I mean Travis's non-playable characters. As we've seen with the earlier campaigns, the NPCs created by the DM exist to essentially be the supporting cast of the story, the people who are in the narrative and may be important to it, but ultimately exist to enhance the journey of the players rather than dominate it. So the fact that the first episode of Graduation is mostly Travis talking to himself as he introduces 19, no exaggeration there, 19 NPCs is a bad sign. Like beyond the fact that it's a bad way to run a TTRPG game, it's just a bad way to tell a story. Have you ever read a fantasy book and you're looking at the first chapter and they just keep throwing out nonsense words and characters left and right that they just expect you to know and remember and internalize, but you don't even know the plot yet, let alone who the fuck Ali and Court and Zoltan are? Yeah, graduation is like that, but without any potential appeal you might get from finally parsing that narrative in the world. It's not helped by the fact that most of the NPCs who appear in the show have pretty much the exact same personality, making it hard to distinguish them or really prefer one over the other. They all generally fit the same brand of being helpful and pleasant and nice without really that much to them, making you wonder why we were introduced to so many of them at once in the first place. Weirdly enough, Travis apparently made full character sheets for all of them, which if you've ever DM'd a game before, you know isn't really done. It's just an interesting example of over-preparation that doesn't do anything to improve the game. This is made even more difficult by the fact that a lot of them don't even get to distinct voices or visual descriptions. You learn their backstories, but not hair color or build or even race. They're just blobs of names all doing the same bit, which is not really what you want for your ensemble. And in general, it's just not in the spirit of what you'd want from a TTRPG podcast either. Rich, detailed worlds with massive and varied supporting casts are great when you're writing a book, but actual play podcasts aren't books. They're games, collaborative playing experiences in which a story is played by a group of people working together on the spot. And Graduation on the whole doesn't really feel like an actual play podcast. It feels like a radio show written by Travis in which the rest of the family are actors without scripts. We've already seen a bit of this with the weak parts of Amnesty and even some of Balance, and it's not helped by the way D&D is played on the show. The McElroys were never experts at Dungeons and Dragons, and I think they'd be the first to admit that. Part of the reason why the Adventure Zone ended up being such a game gateway into D&D is because the family started out unfamiliar with it, meaning that you got to see the group evolve from barely understanding the game to pulling off the emotional highs you would get by the end of Balance. If you're not familiar with the system, you get to learn alongside them and watch what a basic D&D game could become. But that was 2014, and the culture has changed since then. 
Not only has the Adventure Zone been going on for almost 150 episodes, but the number of other actual play podcasts has skyrocketed, a lot of them made by very talented performers or people who have been playing TTRPGs for years, if not decades. These are people who live for these sorts of games, not just for recording and content, but also for fun and in their spare time. Furthermore, the increase in DNA's popularity brought on by such things like the Adventure Zone means that you have a lot more people now who have personally experienced DD and can more easily distinguish the difference between good and bad DD, which is why graduation stands out as bad DD. It even comes down to the way the system is used. There's hardly any dice rolling in this D20 based game, and when there is, it doesn't really change things anyway because it's for skill checks that don't matter. There's basic misunderstandings of the rules, like the fact that Travis keeps denying Clint's character Argo, who is a rogue, any of his class features or abilities, and then making fun of Clint for being bad at D&D. And okay, being bad at the rules isn't always the worst thing. The family has made it pretty clear that their stories are less about strict adherence to following the rules of a system exactly as written, and more, well, improvised radio play. They've consistently gotten rules wrong throughout all of the systems they've played, from complicated ones to D&D to basic ones like Honey Heist that have like two rules. They've made it clear that it's less important to get all of the rules right and more important to tell a compelling story. But they aren't misinterpreting the rules to tell more interesting stories or have fun here. Combat is boring, usually just two turns of going through the motions without much fanfare until an NPC comes along and puts a stop to things by heroically saving the characters, meaning none of the fights have any real tension or stakes. The players overall sound disinterested and out of it. At one point they joke that they have so little involvement in the plot that they could just sail away and abandon it all. Besides the overabundance of near identical NPCs and seeming disinterest in the game, you also have the excessive railroading of the player characters. So railroading in the TTRPG world is when the DM has such a tight grip on the story that it allows for little to no player choice or deviation from whatever the DM wants to do. You know, like one of those train things. It's not necessarily the same thing as a narrative just being linear, but rather it happens when the players have very little agency, when they're prevented from engaging with the story in reasonable ways or good faith ideas are shot down, or the story's direction seems not to rely even a little bit on players' actions or input. It's not necessarily like this adventure relies on these characters following the goblin's trail to the cave and finding the dragon, but rather, for instance, oh, you don't want to fight the dragon? Too bad, your character just gets mind controlled into doing it anyway. No, you don't get to make a saving throw, it just happens. Now roll initiative. Graduation has a lot of it, like a lot, a lot. There are a number of big important story events in Graduation that just don't really make sense, that are clearly there because Travis is dictating the story and has a certain way that he wants the story to go. Some of these instances can be relatively simple, like superpowered NPCs always showing up to save the day at the end of combat encounters. Others can feel nonsensical, like when he decided that Griffin's character Fitzroy should have his magic taken away by a divine being, even though Griffin is a sorcerer and not a warlock, which means his magic doesn't come from divine beings and so it shouldn't really work like that. Or when a well-known trait with Justin's character is that he refuses to lie and so Travis keeps trying to make him take lying classes and keeps giving him like magical items to make him good at lying and seemingly gets frustrated with Justin when he won't make his character lie. And then it can be incredibly frustrating, like when the party decides not to participate in the grand epic demon war and instead plan a heist to disrupt the economy and bring down capitalism, and so they spend four episodes preparing and then executing the heist, only for the heist to have no effect on the world whatsoever and for the players to be teleported to the battleground of the grand epic demon war. What's really strange about it is that it feels like a narrative that's both excessively planned out, but also totally made up as it goes along. One of the things about railroading is that theoretically, if you're doing it, you're doing it because you have a good and focused story that you're trying to tell. A roller coaster is on rails and can only go one way, but still manages to be fun at the end of the day. It can still make something at the very least entertaining, but graduation's story just feels aimless, as if every choice was made in a moment of panic, as if Travis was desperately attempting to figure out what all to do to make it work. And I know that's the case because Travis specifically admitted to it in the post campaign recap episode they put out because there were just like he, like for example uh chaos wasn't like a planned character until like two episodes before i introduced them the thing is is like i did not know what the next episode was going to be when we were recording any given episode but even if he didn't outright admit it, it's very, very obvious. There were a lot of half-hearted attempts to get things to work, or just attempts to focus on specific themes, but they never really got there. 
like as previously mentioned, the characters decide that capitalism is bad and they're going to overthrow it, which hell yeah, I'm on board. <laughs> but like the story doesn't seem to really get what capitalism is and why it's bad. They do the aforementioned raid on the guild and destroy some contracts and we get the idea that bureaucracy is bad, but it never really turns into a full fledged critique of capitalism besides them just saying it sucks and then they go back to an unrelated plot point about fighting an evil demon prince. Also, the characters all end the story being successful wealthy entrepreneurs and capitalism still exists and critiques of it are never brought up again. It's just really indicative of a series that had vague concepts of themes that could be cool but never really got it to come together. Even just the fact that the premise was supposed to be about a school for heroes and villains to the extent that the marketing material for the show heavily, heavily emphasized this, and yet the setting got almost entirely dropped nearly immediately is an indicator that Travis was really struggling to make the setting work and wasn't really sure what graduation was supposed to be. In a post-campaign retrospective, Travis stated that he transitioned away from the school premise because he found that it wasn't a good setting for running a D&D game as it placed too many limitations on the world and characters and stories that could be told. Pretty quickly, it did, as you said, begin to feel very restrictive as far as like going on adventures went because I think that the school setting is great for like interpersonal dramas and conflict and stuff, but not so great about like task oriented things. Which for starters is bullshit. There are tons of long form campaigns that utilize school settings and there's lots of potential there. One could easily do, I don't know, 123 plus episodes entirely in a magic school setting. It's just about being creative and knowing how to balance the tropes we associate with school stories and the narrative conventions and style of typical D&D campaigns. It can be done, you just have to put that effort in. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, if Travis was having issues with the school setting or realized it was too limiting, shouldn't that be realized, I don't know, a few episodes in before the campaign really got started and episodes came out? I want to remind everyone of that original graduation trailer, the one that focused so heavily on the school premise. This isn't something you just casually whip up. You don't pull a fully animated, fully orchestrated, voice acted three minute trailer out of thin air. This has to have required a fair amount of planning and time and money and resources in order to get this done and out. It's a professional looking trailer and that sort of highlights the oncoming problem, doesn't it? And then there's the uh, way graduation handles minority issues, which, uh, okay. So as previously stated, the McElroys have an interesting history when it comes to inclusivity. They evolved from their edgy roots to being seen as the good, good boys and allies and creating a general safe space environment in not just their shows, but their overall personas. Oftentimes, this has taken the form of finding the line by crossing it, making a mistake and then getting criticism for it and apologizing. And in general, they've managed to maintain that vibe in Taz as well. Like, there have been some minor controversies and backlash, but I mean, they made Loop and everyone loves Loop. But then graduation ended up having some issues. Like, okay, just for starters, there's this NPC named Rainier who is this perky necromancer and also is in a wheelchair. I feel bad introducing her like that, but that's literally how she's introduced in the podcast. She shows up in a floating chair, she approaches the main characters, and she introduces herself and then goes, you're probably wondering about the chair, huh? Which is, oof. I will say, at the very least, that the character is apparently based on a real-life disabled friend of Travis's who doesn't mind being asked about her disability assistance devices and has said that she liked the moment. Nevertheless, a lot of chronically ill wheelchair users, including people who reached out to me after I announced I was doing this video, were really not happy about it, especially because there's already such a persistent culture of disabled people being asked invasive questions about their disability, or even just being seen first and foremost as having no other traits or interests besides just being disabled. Both the fact that this moment happened at all and the fact that it's one of the very first things the character ever says made a lot of folks really frustrated. There's even a moment where she uses her wheelchair as like a battering ram to knock on a door instead of just knocking, and it's portrayed as this comedic moment and it just comes off as really thoughtless, especially in the context of all the praise the story has gotten for having a disabled character on the show. The whole thing feels very not great. Like, is it neat to have a disabled character in Taz? Yes, it is, especially considering how much controversy there is over whether or not wheelchairs should be allowed in D&D, they absolutely should be by the way, having a character who is disabled 
disabled integrated into this D&D podcast should be an exciting and cool thing. Except it kind of isn't because it makes it seem like you're placing the disabled status of the character front and center in ways that can feel unnatural at best and inappropriate at worst, rather than just letting her be a character. This also applies to the series representation of non-binary characters. And once again, I am going to preface this by saying my very trans co-writer Emily is writing this section, so <laughs> don't blame me. Anyway, one of the things about the non-binary characters is that a fair bit of them introduce themselves with their pronouns first and foremost, which, okay. There's been controversy over whether or not people should say their pronouns out loud when they first meet someone, and that's, you know, an issue that could be talked about. But what stands out about this is that it's just the non-binary characters. And you, you must be Kai. I am. I I'm, I'm, I'm Kai. Uh, <laughs> my pronouns are they, them. Like, if every single one of the 86 NPCs in graduation introduced themselves by saying, Hi, I'm George Juckman, my pronouns are he, him, that would be one thing. But by having the non-binary NPCs and only the non-binary NPCs do this, it creates this sense of othering. Whether intentional or not, it's presenting the idea that non-binary characters are not the norm and will be treated differently than the other characters, and that sucks and can feel really tokenizing. Anyway, I'd like to note that my very trans trans co-writer Emily she, her, who is trans wrote that section. <laughs> She wrote that joke too. I'm not actually tokenizing her. She wrote she wrote this whole thing. Fuck. Taz had featured non-binary characters before. Balance had quite a few of them, and the handling of them was, you know. Well, just about all of them get misgendered at least once at some point in the podcast, which you could just edit out or change in post if you noticed that, which you probably should have, but you know. This occurs at least once in graduation as well. There was also this cool non-binary biker gang leader named Hollis in Amnesty, and they were just introduced like any other character on the show, which makes it weird that they got it right before and then got it wrong later. While there are some non-binary characters in graduation who weren't introduced by saying their pronouns, they're mostly characters like the personification of Chaos and Order or Festo the Naked Fairy, aka characters who are decidedly non-human, which is its own form of othering. And then there's the strange race stuff too. There's an entire arc centered around the main trio encountering a tribe of centaurs, and the word tribe is important there because these centaurs live off of nature, worship forest spirits, place great emphasis on their cultural heritage, have this conflict with another tribe that they need outsiders to help with based around this mystical sacred nature object, and it's all very coded. When you listen to the podcast, the centaurs feel coded to be indigenous people, and it's not great. Like, the boys are brought in to retrieve this apple, which is sacred to these two centaur tribes because their headmaster told them to, and so they come in and make jokes about the culture and save the day and talk to the centaur's god and explain everything the centaurs did wrong and how backwards they are, and then they just take this sacred spiritual resource from this tribe and bring it back to the school. Even just the general idea that these random first year students are the ones being asked to mediate a conflict between this old and complicated civilization they know nothing about, and they're framed as automatically knowing what's best for these backwards people better than the actual tribes do, is just really reminiscent of colonialist tropes about indigenous people. You know, just a fun, no bummers game of D&D &D colonialism. And I'm not pulling this out of nowhere, by the way. A lot of indigenous critics have expressed concern over the arc and explained why they feel like the centaurs came out looking like shitty indigenous stereotypes. And there's like this weird moment where Travis tells the players that before they meet with the centaurs, they should abandon the horses they're riding because riding horses in front of centaurs might offend them. And then the boys meet the centaurs and the centaurs are like, why aren't you riding horses? And they're like, oh, we thought you'd have a problem with that. And the centaurs played by Travis are like, why would we have a problem with that? Sounds like you made some negative assumptions about us, huh? And the whole thing is just weird. People did actually contact the McElroys after this part of the podcast went up to explain how insensitive the depiction of the centaurs were in hopes that the boys would respond to the criticism and either correct it going forward or at the very least address that they understood what was wrong. But instead, nothing happened. So far, none of them have commented on the depiction of the centaurs at all. Just total silence. It's especially worth noting that some of the problems with how the podcast handles indigenous characters didn't start with graduation. Commitment, one of the aforementioned mini-arcs GM'd by Clint, features Justin's player character, who, as previously stated, is an Anuk woman named Irene, who sometimes turns into a super powerful goddess named Cardala, Bruce Banner, and Hulk style. 
This would be fine on its own, especially if Justin had consulted with people from the culture and was given an idea of what's okay and what's respectful and what's not, and he did claim to consult with folks before playing her. Except Cardala isn't portrayed super well. She's portrayed as aggressive and loud and not super smart, and there's this whole scene where she goes on about how she demands meat to eat, and it's one of those things that works with a Hulk-like character where there are no associated stereotypes and baggage that come with saying something like that, but less so when a pretty popular and harmful stereotype about Inuit people involves excessively eating raw meat. The character didn't get a ton of backlash when she came out because, well, not a lot of people listened to Commitment, but with the superpower of hindsight and after the way some indigenous coded characters in Graduation were handled, people started looking back on Kardala a lot more critically. A lot of critics, particularly indigenous critics, were just not happy with a character played by a white dude based on Inuit culture being violent and dumb and warlike and obsessed with eating meat. That's not to say no indigenous people ever liked the character, but Cardala started getting a lot more retroactive criticism once it became clear that these portrayals were kind of starting to become a pattern. Then there's this stuff with asexuality too. Griffin's character Fitzroy is aromantic and asexual. He's not interested in relationships or anything like them. And yet Travis keeps having Rainier flirt and make advances towards Fitzroy, who is completely and totally uninterested. This leads to various scenes of Fitzroy having to reassert himself over and over again, and it feels bad. It feels bad. Beyond the fact that just having a DM try to force a romance between a player character and an NPC when the player isn't interested is already not good, making a canonical, aromantic, asexual character repeatedly have their sexuality challenged like that can just feel out of touch at best. It's not even a thing where it's like, oh, this is done to showcase an experience asexual people can go through where they have to reject advances that they're not comfortable with because of the pressure put onto them by the rest of the world. No, this is just a DM deciding that two characters would make a cute couple. All of this led to increased backlash towards the McElroys, especially Travis, and to a lesser extent, Justin. It's not as if the family or Taz hadn't experienced any sort of pushback on social issues before, once again there was the taco incident, but they were still overall regarded as well-meaning figures, champions of social justice and representation. So graduation having these issues, and having said issues cause more of a backlash with their audience meant a shift in perception, where people started to realize that, at the end of the day, the McElroys are two straight cis white guys from West Virginia, not perfect beacons of minority representation. The fan response to graduation overall is quite interesting. Like, it's hard to get actual streaming numbers for the podcast. The only people who would really have that data are the McElroys and their team, and it's not really in their best interest to release that stuff publicly. You can take a look at the Google Trends results and see that searches for the Adventure Zone have gone down since its peak in August of 2017 when Balance had its finale. That alone shows a decline in interest over time since then. But I think beyond just looking at backlash, one of the most interesting ways to determine how a property is being perceived by its fan base is to look at fan enthusiasm, or in this case, the lack thereof. There's not a lot of fan content out there for graduation, like just in general. If you look at the Taz-related tags on Tumblr, you're gonna see maybe some fan art of the main trio and some of Rainier, but not much for the other NPCs or any actual moments from the series. Looking up animatics on YouTube gets you very few results too. Graduation animatics do exist, but they're few and far between, mostly for the early episodes and get relatively few view counts in comparison to their previous counterparts. There are over 10,000 Taz fanfics on AO3, and out of those 10,000, I can find less than 300 that are about graduation. And that's sad. And there are a few reasons why it's like this. I mean, the obvious one is just that grad is still pretty recent, having started in late 2019 and having just now ended in spring 2021. Plus, the great cursed clusterfuck of 2020 meant that there weren't really any conventions or live shows where fans could do things like cosplay or see side stories that took place in the world, which would definitely influence things. And then there's cynical takes, like the reason why there isn't that much fan art of NPCs is that the NPCs are mostly described so generically that it's hard to even get a grasp on what they look like, let alone enough of a personality to grow attached to and want to make creative work about. There is one exception to this though, one graduation NPC that caused a spike in the fandom, that received universal praise and adoration, and is perhaps the most beloved character in all of graduation. I am, of course, talking about Bingus. Bingus, spelled in all lowercase, is a hairless tabaxi introduced in episode 31 of the podcast, known for their huge, beautiful eyes and their giant enchanted grey sword with the word sword labeled on it. 
Using their skills as the world's greatest swordsmen, they assist the party with taking down the Heroic Oversight Guild, otherwise known as Hog. Of course, things get more complicated as the story progresses, as it's revealed that Bingus is secretly an angelic vampire who also has the powers of time travel. It's also revealed that they're Argo's secret parent and that they killed the rest of their family members, but find new companionship with Susan the Bear, the immortal bear who has her memory wiped after every combat encounter. Susan the Bear, by the way, is a character on the podcast introduced in episode two. They fight this bear at the school to train, and then the players are like, is this bad? <laughs> is this fucked up? So Travis has to go on this whole tangent about how Susan the Bear is treated very well and feels no pain and is constantly mind wiped, and it's supposed to be like reassuring, which is a shame because the animals we use to train our humans undergo terrible violence and get regularly mind wiped to forget about it is sincerely an interesting thing to explore in terms of why the school might be bad, but it was instead used as a way to hand wave the characters doing anything morally rough. But luckily, at the very least, she has Bingus. Perhaps the peak of Bingus' story is when, during the solar eclipse, they are forced to open their eyes in order to fight off the demon horde, thus losing their eyesight, one of their most notable features. Bingus was an instant hit with fans and has led to the creation of all sorts of fan content, from artwork to stories to the popular bingo ship and everything. They're by far the most popular character in Graduation, with so many fan works made about them. There's something about Bingus that just excited people in a way that no other Graduation NPC really did, and it's hard to say what that thing was. Maybe it's that Bingus isn't actually a graduation NPC. They're not real. They never were. Susan the bear is real, though. The bear gets attacked and mind wiped after every fight and never gets mentioned again. Okay, okay. So I guess some context to explain how we got here. All right, so like most popular media franchises, The Adventure Zone has a subreddit called, well, r slash The Adventure Zone. It's it's a fan subreddit. It exists as a place for fans to talk about a media property and share their artwork and thoughts and theories and all that. At its best, it is totally fine, a harmless place, about what you expect from this sort of thing. But things got a bit complicated around the release of Graduation and its increasing unpopularity. Suddenly, you saw a significant section of the user base getting more and more frustrated with the podcast. This frustration made its way through the subreddit. Official discussion threads for grad episodes were essentially the Reddit equivalent of being ratioed, downvoted for seemingly no reason other than to express disapproval with the series itself while hundreds of comments poured in complaining about the episode. There would be frequent infighting outside of these discussion threads as people would argue over whether or not graduation was worth listening to, or if graduation had hit its stride yet, or if people were just being too hard on the McElroys. It's not necessarily unusual behavior. This can happen often in subreddits because Reddit is a cursed place built so randoms on the internet can yell at each other. <laughs> Eventually, tensions in the main sub grew so much that the mods would often step in to try and put a stop to it and take down things labeled as excessive negativity. This also proved to be unpopular, as it was seen as silencing legitimate discussion and criticisms in order to seemingly enforce that McElroy no-bummers energy. There was also this line in that post about how the negativity meant that the subreddit couldn't invite the McElroys on for Q&As anymore, which weird thing. There was a lot of drama back and forth and it was a whole thing, but the point that matters is that this caused a large number of users to migrate towards a secondary subreddit called r slash Taz Circle Jerk, which existed to poke fun of the original subreddit, Taz's fanbase, and the podcast as a whole. Taz Circle Jerk began to grow in popularity as the podcast continued to disappoint its audience and as the subreddit continued to disappoint its fans. It got to the point where Taz episode discussion threads would have more upvotes and more engagement in the Circle Jerk subreddit than they did in the original, and also were put up sooner and were generally more organized for some reason. Okay, so subreddit drama. Cool, great. How does this relate to Bingus? Okay, so remember how I talked about how Graduation had way too many NPCs? Yeah, so a Reddit user known as Star Keaton decided to do a project in which they listened to Graduation and documented the new NPCs who appeared in every episode. Names, pronouns, basic descriptions of who they were, all that. This was meant to be both a legitimate guide to help people who might be confused trying to remember all the characters, and also a way to highlight just the absurd amount of NPCs being introduced. It's actually buck wild to read the list post by post, as you see them go from neutrally trying to list out everyone like a wiki article to just frustration and desperation. It's a gradual descent into madness, and it's a lot of fun. Anyway, during their eighth character list update, documenting the characters who appeared in episodes 1 to 35, they decided to have a little bit of fun because they were bored. They decided to put down that in episode 31, a hairless tabaxi named Bingus appeared with a little short bio before clarifying in spoiler tags that they made the character up. 
The whole point was to make fun of the number of pointless NPCs that Travis had in the show by including something that honestly seemed pretty possible. I mean, considering that this show once had a character named Garfield, and also a character named Heathcliff, is it really that absurd to think that Travis would include this character Bingus named after a cat that became a meme on the internet? Anyway, so Taz Circle Jerk took this and went wild with it. It started with Starkeaton themselves making and posting their own fan art of Bingus, and then more people joined in, and then more and more, and then they began joking about the lore for the character, all these cool moments that happened in the series, and a mythology around Bingus began to form. In less than two weeks, about 71 pieces of Bingus fan content were posted on the Circle Jerk subreddit alone. But Bingus couldn't be contained, and so then people started taking the art outside of Reddit, using the Taz tags on Tumblr and Twitter. They would respond to the episode release posts on Twitter, asking when Bingus was going to show up. There was a small but passionate campaign to see if they could get the McElroys to acknowledge Bingus on the show. Soon, fans not in the know would start asking legitimate questions about Bingus and when they appeared in the podcast to try to find out if graduation was worth listening to to learn about this legendary vampire angel tabaxi. And while the Bingus hype has died down like most memes do, it still lives on as one of the most notable parts of Graduation's legacy. You can't talk about Graduation without talking about Bingus, and that's honestly kind of funny. On its surface, the Bingus phenomenon seems simple. A bunch of people came up with a joke meme character and then made a bunch of joke memes with them. But that's not really the case. Bingus wasn't just a joke or a meme, but a response, a character whose existence was designed around the tropes the Adventure Zone was used to using and the NPC trappings that Graduation had found itself falling into. Bingus was portrayed as being this almighty force with a mysterious backstory who was greatly overpowered compared to the heroes and frequently put into situations where they would save the day and kill the enemies for everyone else. Which, as we know, happened a lot in Graduation. It's not necessarily so much about the original details of Bingus, they could have just easily been a one-armed wizard named Jombo and it wouldn't really have changed much, but it's more about what the fandom did with that character that's the real point of interest. Because here's the thing. A lot of the Bingus fan content is legitimately impressive. Like, for every shit post and deliberate joke drawing, you can get some amazing artwork, some really interesting stuff, people giving it their all for a character that's not even a real part of the work. And for me, Bingus represents less of a desire to be mean and more an act of love. A group of creative people desperate to find something to inspire them in graduation who instead turn to taking things in their own direction. It's why it went from just jokes about how cool Bingus was to making deliberately emotional fan art of them, playing off of a lot of the artwork you'd see done for the more tear-jerking moments in balance. Things like Bingus losing their eyesight in the eclipse feels like a big epic resolution that you wouldn't get to see in graduation. Bingus' friendship with Susan the Bear allows some commentary on a forgotten, very much regal NPC who has a legitimately tragic setup with horrifying implications. And overall, it's just cool. It's cool to see a group of people take a basic concept that one of them came up with and modify it, improvising and working together to create a unified vision and story that can be fun and sad and moving, and overall just creating this sense of collaborative storytelling. And on a completely opposite note from that, let's talk about graduation, which was still going on. For the most part, Graduation just kept chugging along, not really changing or improving much over time. The cast still didn't seem all that into it, the plot was still confusing, it still seemed very railroady. As far as plot stuff goes, there was one controversy about a scene that happened in episode 35. In it, Festo, a professor who is also a non-binary fairy, lures the trio into the woods for a party and then forces Fitzroy to take drugs that will make him high and also give him his magic back. It's a very strange scene because, well, it's a naked teacher in the woods forcing drugs on one of their students, and that caused a conversation as to the consent of the action and whether or not it's weird for a teacher to drug their student. Author's note, it's very fucking weird. Fans complained about it, saying that it was tone deaf at best and disgusting at worst, especially considering that Festo is presented as good and is not really criticized by the narrative for it. Eventually, the McElroys responded to the backlash by adding a content warning at the start of the episode, saying that the episode involved drug use. Which wasn't the problem, but okay. And then the series just went on, never questioning this decision or the ethics of it at all. Just, yeah, choices. Choices were made. <laughs> choices were definitely made. It was around this time that you started to see more and more public acknowledgement that graduation wasn't working. And by that I mean Griffin straight up said in an interview that they had already started working on the next campaign and that Griffin was going to be DMing it. This was very reassuring to a lot of people, as it meant that not only would they get their sweet baby boy DM Griffin back, but it also meant that graduation was presumably coming to an end soon. 
Then it was announced that not only was the next campaign soon, but they had already started recording it, even though graduation wasn't finished yet, which to be clear had never happened before, which excited people even more because it meant, once again, grad was probably close to being over. And sure enough, a few weeks later, Taz's graduation would come to a whimper of an ending after 38 episodes and 86 NPCs. Honestly, the finale was fine as far as episodes go, but after closing off such a frustrating story, it was kind of too little too late. There's something to be said about the balance of graduation and the adventure zone as a whole between a fun family D&D game and a professional product being put out to be consumed by the masses. By the time graduation had started, the adventure zone had released its first two best-selling graphic novel adaptations. It was selling out venues for live shows. It was about to have an animated TV series picked up for a pilot. Also, they released a book on how to be good at podcasting with some incredible segments like this one about what yes ending supposedly means. Great stuff. This is a certified moneymaker now, a franchise. And while having more attention and revenue is good for most creators, it does also come with certain expectations as to what that product should look like. And that's where graduation's troubles come in. All these issues that I've talked about here with graduation honestly aren't that unique or different from a lot of people's bad D&D experiences. If you go look up RPG horror stories, you're gonna see a lot of things that sound similar to the stuff you'd hear in graduation. And there's a reason that a lot of people were able to identify identify graduation's weak points and relate to it on a personal level. All these things like the railroading and the excessive, barely distinguishable NPCs and the messy plots are the sort of things you get when a novice DM like Travis attempts to do a long form campaign for the first time. And under normal circumstances, that's fine. Everyone starts out from somewhere and it's important to gain experiences like this so that you can learn and grow. But the problem is that the Adventure Zone is a brand, it's a product. Not to try to paint it as if the McElroys don't have any passion or care about it at all, I'm sure they still do. But it's more that when something does get to this level of popularity, when it does gain this sort of reputation and when it does start gaining profits, fans generally are gonna wanna see the show be good, the best it can be. It is in their best interest, not just as creatives, but as content creators to at least try to put out a good show. And so seeing the Adventure Zone do a campaign that feels so sloppy is bad. The thing is, a lot of these things weren't new to graduation. A lot of this stuff has been present in the series since the beginning. The McElroys started Taz being very open about the fact that they weren't knowledgeable about D&D, that they were learning as they went, that Taz was a comedy and entertainment podcast first and an actual play one second. Even the jokes about Clint being bad at D&D have been there since the beginning. And yet there was something about graduation that just made fans really frustrated by it all. Like this was the breaking point. Even the release schedule got hit by this backlash. Taz has always, with a few exceptions, released on a bi-weekly schedule. And for the most part, with the exception of some stuff like The Soul and Century, this wasn't really a problem. Fans would wait patiently for the next episode and enjoy it and be satisfied. But now there was a growing backlash against Taz's upload rate. A part of this is because of comparisons to other actual play podcasts that weren't there when balance was a thing. With the increased popularity of both D&D and other systems, as well as the now saturated market of TTRPG podcasts, the bar is a lot higher for quality. When you're seeing other small podcasts managing to put out hours worth of recorded content every week, seeing a podcast as big as the Adventure Zone struggle to put up an hour every two weeks can be frustrating, especially considering that an episode could be lacking in things like editing or uploaded at inconsistent times or just not be very good. I'm not saying that the Adventure Zone should update more frequently or that the McElroys are obligated to produce content at a quicker rate. No, far from it. Creators are people and people have a lot going on and it's fine for them to upload things at the rate that they feel comfortable uploading at. That's fine. It's more that it just goes to show how graduation was frustrating a lot of people. It's messy and slow paced story mixed with its relatively slow upload schedule meant that even for people who were into graduation, spending something like two months of real world time to release four episodes of planning for a heist that didn't even matter can be aggravating. And if you were someone who wasn't into grad, who wanted it to be over sooner so you could experience whatever came afterward, well, that meant you'd be waiting a long, long time. The group would follow this up with an episode of The The Adventure Zone Zone, their occasional retrospective after show podcast in which they reflected on the campaign before jumping straight into the next season, Ether Sea, the smallest gap in content there's ever been between Taz seasons. You'd think this would be the end of it, right? Graduation 
conversation ended, Griffin was back in the DM chair again, and Ether C goes on and everything goes back to normal. But it's not the end, because in order to fully talk about Taz, the everything that's been going on with it, you can't just talk about the podcast. No, because it's not just the podcast that this affected. Let's talk about the McElroy brand. Okay, I think I fixed the dream filter thing. I had to wait until there was like a narratively satisfying point to do it so it wouldn't be jarring, but I think I fixed it. Among Us is a video game that originally came out in 2018 to relatively little fanfare, but exploded in popularity in 2020 as various popular streamers began to play the game. The game is a relatively simple retooling of the party game Mafia. You and your friends are on a spaceship and you know, you have a variety of tasks you have to complete in order to win. However, among the group are imposters whose job is to kill off all the other players on the ship without getting caught. It's a fun and simple game, and its basic but chaotic structure means that it's easy to have a good time playing it, whether that's legitimately playing it or just goofing around with your friends. And over the past year, it's become a force of its own, able to hold its ground against other popular multiplayer streaming games like Minecraft and Fortnite. Why am I explaining Among Us? Because it's the game Travis McElroy was playing when he decided to make a ass of himself. Back in March, Travis joined in a popular streamer's Among Us stream as a guest. It was a casual game, something said streamer does often with their friend group, and Travis was brought into a group that was already pretty close. He then proceeded to do this honestly very annoying baby voice for most of the stream and kept insisting on it to the point where he told everyone else to shut up so he could do a scene with himself using it. Yeah, it's gonna hit the corner. I was running around for trying to Hey, Blood! Hey! Wait, everybody who's dead! Everybody who's dead, shut up! Let the scene play out, please. Blood, you've always been like a father to me! And this frustrated everyone else so much that they began to vote off Travis as a joke and pretend like he was always the imposter, which led him to make this speech. Trav, what's your favorite type of candy? Uh, it's not really fun for me, if I'm being honest, this style of play where like it just seems chaotic for the purpose of it so like we know it's cheesy and i have an audience who's watching because they want to see us play the game so if we're not going to play it right then we i don't know it's just not as fun Child, hey, everybody, all, for, for real um playing to frustrate each other is not a fun way to play because we're all on the same team and that team is to have fun together and to make it entertaining for our audience. Yeah, and totally, fun together. Yeah, absolutely. And so when people make plays just to frustrate each other and just Hell to yeah. troll each other, there's enough of that in the world today of people trolling each other to be mean and to be hurtful. And if we're gonna play in this space together, we need to do it because we want each other to have fun and not because we're trying to frustrate each other because there's enough frustrating things in the world right now and there's enough we can't control. And one of the things we can control is that everyone's here to have fun and not waste each other's time. And so when we make decisions that are meant to troll each other, that's something that bad people do. Huh. Okay. I don't know where to begin with this. The long monologue trying to be some disciplining presence on other people's video game stream. The fact that he compared people messing with him in Among Us to the real world atrocities going on in the world today. Or even just hearing a grown adult tell other grown adults that's something bad people do as if you're talking to a three-year-old. I tend to be like the Travis defender of my friends too, but it's just... Uh... Around this time, Travis also got involved in another controversy, this time on Twitter. He made this thread about how attractive Harry Styles was and how he's straight but would love to go on a date and hold his hand and how it was surprising that Travis wasn't bisexual. And this thread caused a surprising amount of backlash because it's, well, as the kids say, kinda cringe. Travis had been criticized for what people considered to be performative progressivism before, but this seemed to be the final straw for people as it was honestly off-putting to see someone who is openly a straight cis man do this weird no homo disclaimer about thinking Harry Styles is cute. And I'm not saying that to be mean or to shut down the possibility that this was a legitimate attempt to explore one's sexuality. I'm saying that because Travis himself admitted it a few hours later. He deleted the tweets and explained that he made the thread solely for attention and validation for seeming open-minded. He announced that he was taking a break from Twitter and was reconsidering his approach to social media going forward. And then the Among Us incident happened like a day later and people started roasting the hell out of him for both things. 
I'm not bringing this up because I want to bully Travis McElroy. No, I don't care what sort of awkward stuff happens on a live stream, nor do I want to punish him for his tweets or anything. I think it's legit great that he acknowledged his flaws and promised to undergo self-reflection, and I wish him the best for that. But I do think this is worth bringing up because it starts to highlight something. McElroy backlash was getting more prominent and more mainstream. The Among Us clip made its rounds on Twitter, being shared by people who found it to be cringe. On March 30th, journalist Gita Jackson published an article on Vice titled, Everyone Loves the McElroys, So Why Is Everyone Mad at the McElroys? It focuses on the growing backlash toward Taz and the McElroys on the whole, trying to understand exactly how we got to this point. It's a legitimately great article, and I highly recommend reading the whole thing. There are a couple parts I want to highlight, however. There's this one where Justin responds to graduation criticisms. There is a vocal part of our audience that has been truly hostile to Travis throughout graduation, and speaking as his brother, it is heartbreaking to see. Like, I really did try his best, and in my opinion, still succeeded a lot more than he failed. But I can't just be the big brother who tells him to shut it all out and keep his chin up. I have to be a collaborator who asks, Okay, what do we learn from this? How do we improve? There's something about this line that's honestly really sad. For years, the family relationship has been seen as one of the McElroy's strengths. It was the thing that gave them a certain chemistry and charm and what made them feel so unique compared to other podcast groups. And yet here we see the potential detriment of mixing family and business. What do you do when you want to be supportive of someone you care about, but you're also now in a high stress corporate situation? That's not just your brother, that's your business partner. There's another quote from an article, though, that's even more damning. Gita writes, One person who described the Adventure Zone as a family D&D game to me was McElroy's PR person when I reached out to them for comment. Most family D&D games do not have their own press representatives. And that's the real root of the problem, isn't it? The McElroys want to present themselves as just being a good-natured family making fun, goofy content. But their productions aren't just passion projects anymore. They're an enterprise, one with marketers and managers and PR representatives. They have book deals and touring contracts and television shows and official merch. The fact of the matter is that at a certain point, you're no longer just a person who makes content. You're a company owner, a public figure, and a brand representative. It's something the McElroys always need to be open about, and it's something that the fans need to accept. Taz would suffer another big moment of controversy this April when they did an advertisement for a personal loan service called Upstart. The Adventure Zone has run ads for a while, and people have been, for the most part, fine with it. But this was off-putting for a lot of the audience, mainly because personal loans are sketchy as hell and a dangerous thing to get into. Upstart itself has an average 25% APR, which is high up there for personal loans. Justin and Travis have both been open about struggling with predatory loans in the past, and so shilling for them in their podcast was seen as both hypocritical and dangerous. Taz's fan base is primarily teenagers and young adults, ones who have been led to believe that they could trust what the McElroys have to say, especially because of the very parasocial relationship between the creators and fans that encourages people to see the creators not just as friends and not just as trustworthy people, but as, like, protectors. Think back to hashtag I am holding your hand. Opening any of your fans up to the possibility of debt and years of high interest payment is bad. It's a bad thing to do. It's what bad people do. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, yeah, if you're a content creator, you're probably going to do sponsorships for companies you don't always 100% agree with, and it would be hypocritical of me to condemn them for that. But this was promoting a service not just from a bad company, but one that could do actual harm directly to the people who listen to the show, especially given the ways the brothers are so often framed as close, trustworthy, wholesome people. And of course, the McElroys never responded to this. Jesse Thorne, the owner of Maximum Fun, did respond to a Reddit thread bringing up the issue where where he said that the business seemed trustworthy based on their research at the time they accepted the deal, and was then immediately provided a link listing multiple bad experiences with Upstart made as far back as 2019. <sighs> yeah, it wasn't a good look. Every year, Maximum Fun runs a big two-week-long fundraising event called the Max Fun Drive, where they produce bonus content and offer quirky rewards like merch or having their cast members get tattoos in exchange for a bunch of people to subscribe to Maximum Fun at the paid level. And every year, Maximum Fun gets a whole ton of new donors, a very, very large proportion of them coming directly from fans of The Adventure Zone and My Brother, My Brother and Me. And the drive has gotten more and more ambitious each year, with the goal in 2016 being something like 4,000 new and upgrading members 
members and the goal being around 25,000 in 2019. They, by the way, got more like 28,000 that year, greatly exceeding their projected goal. They didn't set an official goal for 2020 because 2020 was not a normal year, but they nevertheless gained over 32,000 new and upgrading members during last year's Max Fund Drive. So when 2021's Max Fund Drive started up and set a goal of 28,000 new and upgrading members, it should have been no big deal. As 2021's Maximum Fund Drive began, the Taz Circle Jerk subreddit decided to band together and start a GoFundMe to raise money for the Native American Disability Law Center in response to graduation's poor handling of Indigenous characters and the McElroy's failure to respond to them, encouraging people to donate the money instead of giving it to Maximum Fun. It's so far managed to raise over $4,125, which is pretty impressive for a shitpost subreddit. I'm gonna leave a link to the GoFundMe in the description because I honestly think it's for a good cause and would love to see more people support it. Max Fun Drive itself, of course, got a lot more attention than this. The rewards were the same as most years. If they reached their goal, the brothers would release Taz bonus content and do different stuff with their hair, and a bunch of merch was offered, and it was honestly pretty standard for Maximum Fun at that point. So when the two weeks were almost up and the drive wasn't even close to its goal, it was a big surprise to a lot of people. The drive was officially supposed to end on May 14th. By May 12th, two days before the drive was to end, they'd only gotten about 12,000 new and upgrading members in total, less than half their goal. Which, don't get me wrong, is still a lot of people, but it's not even close to what they'd raised last year or what they hoped to raise this year. In the final two days of Max Fun Drive, they ramped up promotion, offering more and more rewards and quietly lowering the goal on their website from 28,000 to 20,000. The drive hit 20,000 on the last day of Max Fun Drive, and they kept the fundraiser going for an extra two days just in case, a practice that had happened in previous years, but just as a way of getting some extra support and never because the fundraiser wasn't close to reaching its goal. Max Fun Drive officially ended on May 17th with about 21,000 new and upgrading members. <laughs> Still very impressive numbers, but leagues behind both last year's fundraiser and their projected goal. Thorne later admitted on Reddit that they'd have to restructure some things and mess with their budgets to adjust to the unexpected drop in revenue. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes at Max Fun, nor am I an expert on every single podcast the network hosts, so I can't definitively say the growing dissatisfaction with the family's content is the sole reason the drive didn't reach its goal for the first time in years and years. It's quite likely that, a year into the pandemic, people's financial situations are just not the same as they were three months into the pandemic, and it's also just possible that people lost interest in Max Fun content as a natural function of outgrowing certain interests. Nevertheless, though, the way this backlash against the podcasts coincided with the drive for the very first time failing to meet its goal is an interesting indicator of what the fan atmosphere surrounding the podcasts is like now. There are still a large number of devoted and loving fans, sure, but the McElroys aren't the untouchable podcast gods they were before. Whether it's because the product got worse or because the fan culture reached its natural breaking point, the atmosphere just wasn't going to be the same as it was back in 2017. Maybe it never will be again. The McElroy's fan culture is incredibly interesting for a number of reasons, but especially the way in which the purported inclusivity and safety of their brand became both its greatest asset and its greatest weakness. There's this tendency for the fan base to see these works primarily as comfort media made by safe, inclusive, and trustworthy people, and that's valid. Comfort media comes in all shapes and forms, and anything can be comfort media, from a D&D podcast that features a character you identify with, or even just a video of two people playing a video game wrong. But this can also be a dangerous tightrope to walk when it's not just about deriving joy from specific works, but seeing specific people, specific strangers, as innately trustworthy or inherently less fallible than most people. This happens a lot with the McElroys, especially because of their family status and the no-bummers attitude that's permeated their fan culture. And well, the family, just like me, just like my co-writer Emily, just like anyone else we watch, are content creators first and foremost. Our job is to put content out there and find ways to get people to watch it. It's great to enjoy it and find comfort and solace in it, especially in a world where finding things that bring you joy is so important, but at the end of the day, what we're consuming is a work put out for entertainment and more likely than not profit. And we have to keep that in mind when we engage with that work because well, this is their job. Obviously, that doesn't mean we should assume the worst of people's motivations if they produce a creative work for profit, but it does mean that an excessive focus on content creators primarily is friends 
friends and sources of personal fulfillment can be dangerous both to the consumers and to the creators. And when that's a focus that these creators seem to have encouraged, to the extent where parasocial relationships are practically a built-in part of the brand, it can be kind of worrying. I would be remiss to mention any of the earlier stuff about Taz Circlejerk and Bingus and a lot of the legitimately good and well thought out criticisms that came from there without also acknowledging that, as graduation started to reach its end, we started to see an increase in a lot of posts from people who clearly just fucking hated Travis and were looking for any excuse at all to get mad at him. Like, he was doing these TikToks about eating salad every day for a while, and yeah, they were cringy, but people would constantly post them to make fun of them, and it's content they never would have had to see if they didn't go looking for it with the explicit intention of getting mad at it. While this content tended to be mocked by the larger community, there was even a few weeks where the trend was to aggressively psychoanalyze the brothers and look for secret hints that they all hated Travis, and it got so ridiculous that the mods had to create a rule against it. But yeah, lots of intentionally seeking out things to get mad at. And I mean, it is worth mentioning that the brothers do this too. They had a whole podcast where the premise was watching a movie they hated a whole bunch to make fun of it, but that doesn't make it feel any better when it's you on the receiving end of it. I can attest to the fact that as some kind of public figure, just going through your normal day with the explicit knowledge that there are entire communities of people out there who absolutely hate your guts and that if you want to read stuff about how much you suck, it's only a few clicks away is a shitty, shitty feeling. I know I'm going to create maybe hundreds of these people just by making this video and it doesn't feel good. <laughs> Especially if you're someone who, like Travis, has been pretty open about struggling with mental health issues in the past. And for the most part, the mods are pretty good about removing stuff that's clearly just there to me mean-spirited, but it can still get pretty uncomfortable, especially when that level of criticism and hate doesn't get equally applied to the bad storytelling decisions and cringy moments when they come from, for example, Griffin or even Clint. Nevertheless, though, I think it's easy to dismiss the entire thing as just a place to be mean to someone, and while I don't think that's fully accurate or fully inaccurate, the bigger question for me is why it exists at all. A space like that exists not out of thin air or because people woke up one day and decided they hated Travis or hated the Adventure Zone, but specifically as a response to an attitude of forced positivity and no bummers that had been so rampant in the community for literal years up until that point. It was, in some ways, the inevitable result of a community that had regularly highlighted positivity and viewing the brothers as friends to an extreme level. And the fact that for some people there, it swung right around to the opposite kind of parasocial relationship, where instead of seeing a celebrity as a personal friend, you see them as a personal enemy is almost inevitable when the attitude in these fan communities has been one of unbridled, almost forced positivity for ages. I think what's interesting about the fan communities that have sprung up around criticizing the McElroys isn't really about whether these communities are in their totality good or bad, but rather the fact that their existence, for better or for worse, is a direct response to an unsustainable fan culture. On the whole, the story of the McElroy family brand and the massive fan culture that sprung up around them is a story about a lot of things. It's a story about how beautiful creative works can arise from family fun and cool ideas. It's a story of a fandom that often creates incredible art and cosplay and stories. It's a story about trying to find positivity even in a harsh and unkind world. But with the nigh unstoppable growth of the McElroy brand being what it was for years, it became the story of a lot of other things as well. And most notably, I think it's a really interesting case study of what happens when you need to balance your creative passions and your income. The Adventure Zone is something that started out as a joke and through a rocky and imperfect journey turned into something bigger. It turned into a compelling story and a massive fandom and a meaningful journey, but it also turned into a huge, possibly multi-million dollar franchise that's still churning out show seasons and graphic novels and animated TV shows. When you're playing D&D, or really just any kind of game with your friends and family, it's okay to fail and be bad sometimes. In some ways, it's encouraged. Failure lets you learn and grow together, and it's the only way you can get better a lot of the time. But when you suddenly have the responsibility not only of producing that content for an audience, but also ensuring the ongoing success of maximum fun and your graphic novels and your show and your ad reads, you can't just focus on having fun and learning through mistakes anymore. Mistakes cost you your fandom. Mistakes cost you thousands of dollars. And when we're not talking about things like too many NPCs, but rather some of the actually harmful tropes that have gone unaddressed, mistakes 
mistakes can do genuine harm to people. After all of this, I'm still coming back to that quote from the Gita Jackson article. The one where Justin says he wants to encourage his little brother and support him, but he also has to think about the fans and what's good for the show and its brand. The tightrope between making things you love and making things an audience will love is tough for anyone who has found a way to monetize their hobby. I've experienced it firsthand with making videos. I love my job and I love that I get to do this, but it creates an additional layer of pressure. If I make a video about something I'm happy about, but an audience doesn't respond well to it, I can't just say, oh well, and move on with no harm done. I have to worry about how that'll affect like rent payments and shit. And I'm not saying this to make it about me or complain about the channel, but rather just to express that this is always a tough divide to walk. And when the Adventure Zone relies so heavily on the themes of small scale, close knit family podcasting, and yet are not only equipped with their own personal PR team and multiple agents, but also an audience upon whom their success relies, it makes it especially hard for those two facets to coexist. And in some ways, while I think a lot of the problems with graduation come down to Travis's DMing and limited enthusiasm from the players, some of this was always inevitable. The Adventure Zone was always going to make something that disappointed fans at some point, and while it didn't have to be this bad, they were never going to live up to the simultaneous demands of small-scale family closeness and large-scale corporate success, because those demands are inherently contradictory. Strangely enough, the Adventure Zone graduation starting with themes of revolutionary anti-capitalism and ending with the characters becoming rich, successful entrepreneurs starts to feel less like a funny anecdote about inconsistent theming and more like a microcosm of what the McElroy brand inevitably has to become to manage two wildly contradicting demands in a pop culture economy that responds to growth with demands for more growth. It's hard to figure out where the Adventure Zone goes from here. The most recent season has just started, and even now, only a few episodes in, it's seeing controversy as people are finding themselves frustrated by the large number of dry world building episodes that are planned to be spread out over several months. Maybe this frustration will die down once those episodes are over and the show moves on to actual D&D, or maybe it won't. Maybe this is just what The Adventure Zone is now, a podcast that will continue to release to diminishing results and an ever divisive fan base. As for the McElroys, well, they'll probably keep on keeping on, I guess. They're still one of the most widely known names in podcasts. They still have several podcasts that get lots of listens, upcoming graphic novels and shows in the works, and a sizable audience who are eager and ready to attend more live shows once the plague is over with. And you know, that's fine, because for all the shade that's been thrown about them in this video, I will still admit that they are very talented and presumably well-intentioned creators who can make some very funny and sometimes very moving stuff. I honestly still like their work. I'll still go back and listen to Balance and Amnesty and Dust and watch their videos, and for all my criticisms of them, I'm still happy that their content is something I can derive joy from. How and if they respond to their growing criticism in future projects still remains to be seen. Either way though, I think the ways in which the fan culture surrounding them uniquely demands them to be one thing, while their growth trajectory as large-scale content creators uniquely demands them to be another, is just fundamentally at odds and probably fundamentally unsustainable. All I can hope is that they take feedback and grow and manage to navigate the bounds of internet stardom in the best and healthiest way they possibly can. And really, that's all I can hope for any of us. As a person who loves D&D, both playing it and listening to others play it, I found it's introduced me to a lot of really interesting concepts I wouldn't have had the opportunity to explore otherwise. Whether it's learning about interesting cultural practices, getting the opportunity to be confident and vulnerable and bond with my friends, or tons more things, I always learn a lot from it. But possibly the most surprising consequence of playing a lot of D&D is that, as someone who swore after high school that I would avoid math like the plague, I end up having to do a lot of it. D&D for me involves the surprising revelation that math can actually be fun and interesting and something I don't mind doing more of. And it's that very revelation that led me to Brilliant, a really, really cool website and my sponsor for this video. Basically, Brilliant is an interactive, hands-on problem-solving website with a mission statement of helping people learn and grow in fields like math and science and coding and computer science with all kinds of interactive puzzles you can use to learn. I've been taking the Computer Science Fundamentals course and the Mathematics Fundamentals course, and the puzzles are honestly just such a fun and creative way to learn more. Whether it's helping me think more quickly on my feet and more analytically, or just making me a better D&D player, I found Brilliant to be super helpful and just a lot of fun. To check it out and learn more, just go to brilliant.org slash Z and sign up for free. And as a special bonus, the first 200 people who use that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. That's the one I've been using and it's incredibly cool, so check it out. That's brilliant.org slash Z.
On top of a big thank you to all my patrons, I would like to specially thank Robert Gelhar, Robert Valentine Allen, Morgan Potter, Queen, Simon Welsh, Sarah Smith, Zach Radley, and our Dorian Thief. This is amazing. Thank you so much and welcome.